Hi friends, great to be here with you for our first episode of the new year. The Proof Team and I wish you a happy holiday season. We're grateful for your engagement over the last year and hope that you've enjoyed learning as much as we have. To thank you for your support, my team and I have created the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, which begins on February 1st. It's a zero cost, 12 week challenge to build science-backed health habits to optimize your physical and mental well-being, reduce your risk of chronic disease, and help you live longer. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof for more details and to download your copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge. Okay, beginning the new year, I'm continuing our tradition of reflecting together on all of the great episodes from last year and to consolidate some of the key takeaways from 2023. Over the next few episodes, you'll hear from a range of guests, including microbiologists, cardiologists, exercise scientists, neurologists, and oncologists on a variety of topics that I believe will enhance your journey to live better for longer. In part one, today's episode, we'll explore the facts around nutrition information, the best diet for cardiovascular health, the role of lipids in heart disease, reversing type two diabetes with diet, the role of nutrition in cancer treatment, and much more. Please do enjoy. Why do you think there is so much confusion? Why do you think that the the average person would, or do you think the average person would find it difficult to determine what a healthy diet is? Um, I think, especially with social media, the access to information is is so you know broad at this point. Everybody has access and. You know, anybody can be an expert and we have podcasts with, you know, millions upon millions of followers who are, you know, listening to a lot of the information being put out there. And I think it's just that you have people with certain beliefs, whether that's because they adopted a certain dietary pattern and improved their health in some way, or at least subjectively, like in the short term, improve their health in some way. And they, they then believe that's the answer. And I can, you know, I can understand that to a degree. I, I feel like I had that early on as well. Um, of course, now I'd, I'd say I'm much more objective in the way I evaluate research, but it, it certainly it's compelling when you make a change and you feel so much better. Um, and then you hear from others that they've experienced the same thing and you want to believe that that this is the way, you know, so to speak. Um, I, I think that's really it. You have, you have individuals like that with large platforms, you know, preaching their stories. They're great storytellers, a lot of them. And then um, others who maybe have had a similar experience or tried something that they recommend felt better, um, they'll of course believe it or, or, you know, then the next day they hear conflicting information and then they're confused again. But I think that's sort of where it comes from. We can get a bit lost in our N equals one anecdote. Yeah. And, and forget that that's uncontrolled and not necessarily the same result. Well, two things. One is we may be attributing our result to the wrong thing. Yeah. (laughs) And secondly, the result that we got from whatever we did may not be something that's replicated for everyone else. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what the research is for. Have you heard of Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of the, people tend to over, um, what's the word? Or they they think they know more than they do. And um, particularly at the beginning when you learn something. So there's a very steep, uh, a learning curve at the beginning of delving into a new topic Mm -hmm. and in that early phase you can sort of become overconfident yes that's the word i was looking for and so your your confidence actually never returns to that level even as you study for years and years and decades um you know, often the people that are dedicated and continue studying start to realize how much they don't know and then humility sort of comes in. And even though they're actually gaining more knowledge over the years, their level of confidence and how they talk about that topic doesn't get back to that very initial mountain of, of confidence that they, re- that they reached. Well, yeah, you get, like, I mean, I get these comments, I know you do too, where people say like, this is wrong or this is that, or, um, you know, they're very direct and, and very confident in their, their claim. But then you hear an expert um, talking about you had Mark Messina on the other day, or at least I listened to it the other day, and, and he's talking about like, you know, this may be something or we don't quite know at this level of exposure what the result is. or You know, it, it's that more cautious sort of language that I don't think we see when you're first learning about the topic and you become you know overconfident in your position.
let's say you're out f- out for dinner and there's a, a young chap next to you in in his 30s and he says dr willett you're the most cited nutrition scientist in the world help me out i go online there's one person saying to eat like this and the next person seems to be saying the opposite what food should i be eating or what principles should i be thinking about if I want to remain in good health into my 60s, 70s, and hopefully beyond? Well, first of all, be careful about going online because <laughs> you can find everything there. It's, uh, and in fact, it's very hard for someone not deeply in the, sci- in the science of nutrition to sort through all the misinformation uh, that's out there in, in the general media. But actually, it's not too complicated. Most people are going to get most of their calories from carbohydrate. And so it's really important that those be healthy forms of carbohydrate, basically whole grains. Uh, second, most of us will get quite a bit of our diet uh, calories from fats, and so it's really important that they be mainly healthy fats like olive oil, canola oil, uh, soybean oil. Uh, of course, plenty of fruits and vegetables and a wide variety is important. As for protein sources, emphasizing uh, plant protein sources like nuts, legumes, soy products, uh, beans uh, being, of course, uh, uh, counted as legumes. Keeping red meat quite low if you want to have it at all, about one serving a week perhaps. Or if you like a big 12-ounce steak, maybe have it a few times a year or once a month, uh, but not uh, large amounts of red meat for sure. Uh, uh, Again, a modest amount of poultry would be okay. Fish a couple times a week is actually a pretty good idea because they are a major source of omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential. I grew up in the Midwest, and we were told that you had to have three or four servings of dairy a day. We find that that's certainly not necessary. Dairy products are not essential, but if you'd like to have them, about one serving a day is probably a good target to aim for, preferably uh, having it as uh, uh, yogurt or some uh, cheese that you really enjoy, but not large amounts of dairy. Right. And, of course, keeping sweets and especially sugar-sweetened beverages on the low side. Yeah, which can be a bit of a challenge. Highly seductive, some of those foods. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing from you is that it's the quality of those macronutrients that really matters when we're thinking about fat or we're thinking about carbohydrates or we're thinking about protein. Those are just umbrella terms. Absolutely. In fact, it really is hardly useful to say fat is good or bad or neutral or uh, carbohydrate is good or bad or neutral. It's really the quality, the form of those uh, macronutrients. Yeah, I've got, I'll put on screen for those watching on YouTube, but that that image of yours I thought was a really nice way of describing some of what you've just described. Yes, well, thank you. And this does really relate to a principle in nutrition that applies to most foods that contain calories or to macronutrients. And if we're really going to uh, discuss whether something is good or bad or neutral, uh, it's all about comparison. Uh, what is the, what's the alternative? Yeah. Uh, and that can make the huge, uh, huge difference. Yeah. I want to put a pin in substitution analyses and, and make sure I right. try and get there. So that way of eating that you kind of just described, which is, you, is a theme of eating, it's not really defined by a particular label. You know, it's not a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet or a pescatarian diet. It seems like you can achieve that with a number of different sort of dietary patterns. Um, But the commonality is that there is an emphasis on unsaturated fats, oversaturated, particularly these plant and marine sources. There's an emphasis on unrefined carbohydrates, particularly Mm -hmm. whole grains. Mm -hmm. And then there's an emphasis on including or emphasizing more so this plant protein and de-emphasizing some of the red meat. Dairy can be included, but um, probably should be careful, I guess, about the dose and how much of that we're, we're having. How is the average adult in this country faring when it comes to kind of meeting those recommendations? Yes, uh, that's a very good description. If there is a label, it would be probably flexitarian, which (laughs) really almost is. There's a lot of flexibility. A lot less divisive, wouldn't it? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Unfortunately, the average American is not doing well at all in terms of diet quality. Uh, There have been various scores uh, to assess diet quality, and they usually come in at about 50 out of 100. Uh, The way in the classes I teach, that wouldn't be passing or close to it. 
or uh, another way of been looking at, that has been looked at is how what percent of Americans are meeting all of the official dietary guidelines, which are which is a low bar, and but even but even with that low bar, only about five percent of Americans uh, meet the uh, U.S. dietary guidelines. What do you think the effect of that is on health? So if we think about the today's chronic disease burden, and I might get you to expand on maybe how that's changed over the last 50 or 70 years, but how? what's the magnitude of effect that a sort of suboptimal diet would be having mm-hmm. on the diseases mm-hmm. that we see relative to, say, mm-hmm. living a sedentary lifestyle or mm-hmm. smoking or drinking mm-hmm. a lot of alcohol? Well, this uh, a poor diet quality certainly has many adverse effects on many diseases, cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes. Now we're seeing neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, Very broadly, we see if we shifted to a healthy dietary pattern, we could prevent about 20, 25%, maybe 30% of premature deaths. But it's not just about living or dying. It's about quality of life as well. Uh, And we do, for example, having uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, we can treat it and we can help people, but it's still a major burden on the quality of life. Or uh, premature cognitive decline is something that's clearly devastating, and a healthy diet can make an important difference. Now, of course, a, diet, a healthy diet isn't going to solve everything. It's really important that we include physical activity, not smoking, avoiding alcohol. And we do see if we do all of those things right, we can add about 10 years of healthy life expectancy, not just living longer and being in a nursing home, but 10 years of, of healthy living. Yeah. So it's, these it's are really these are really important impacts. Do we need more studies? Like, where do you feel our level of understanding is at? Is it that we need more studies to further understand how nutrition is affecting chronic disease, or do we know enough and it's about finding ways to actually implement that knowledge? Uh, This has certainly shifted over time that uh, the reason we started our long-term studies was back in the 1970s. I was just getting started in my research career and I was looking at the dietary recommendations that were being made, like avoid eggs uh, and Uh, other recommendations, for example, three servings of dairy a day. And I started looking at what evidence there was to support those recommendations. And there really was none. It was, it was guesswork uh, uh, based on the best available evidence, but that was virtually no evidence. Uh, You would have thought that people, there would be evidence showing that if, if people ate two eggs, they had higher risk of heart attack. Uh, there are more, more than two eggs a, a week, they had higher risk of heart attack, but there weren't any such studies. There were not studies looking at the optimal amount of milk consumption, for example. So I decided that we should really set up some long-term studies so we could track the diets of hundreds of thousands of people and find out what happened to them depending on what they ate. And of course, controlling for lots of other variables like uh, physical activity and smoking that might be correlated with diet. So we did enroll over the next couple of decades about uh, over 250,000 men and women and we've been tracking those uh, wonderful participants and learning about what a healthy diet uh, can look like. And w- we've learned a lot during that period of time. And we do have a pretty good picture very broadly of what a healthy diet has looked like. And it's not just our study, but lots of other studies have confirmed the same kind of big picture. So I think you're absolutely right that uh, today we should, we need to be putting more emphasis on how we help people move to a healthy diet, uh, where we have good evidence about what that looks like. Uh, that said, there's still a lot to be learned about, say, just vegetables. They're very different kinds of foods. You know, what does a carrot have in common with a head of cauliflower? Uh, and it's likely that some vegetables are more beneficial than others. It's even possible that some have some harmful effects. In fact, we do see, we do have some examples of that. So we can, I think as time goes on with better data, we can uh, focus and refine our guidance a little bit, like here's a handful of vegetables you want to make sure you eat during the week. more granular. Right, yes. So there's uh, more research to be done. But again, we the biggest issue now is putting into action uh, the knowledge that we've, that we've learned over the last few decades.
you're looking at all of these different popular dietary patterns that people are exposed to, whether they're reading articles online or buying diet books or on social media. How, how well do these dietary patterns mix, meet certain characteristics of a dietary pattern that we know leads to good long-term health? Yeah, that part I was already established. So nobody's, where did, how come you didn't cite my paper? I wasn't trying to cite your paper. It's just trying to show if they match the 2021. And what were the high level? What are those characteristics of what had been established as characteristics of a dietary pattern that lit, lend to lend themselves to good long-term health? You will be shocked. It's more vegetables and fruits and whole grains. Like some of that stuff never changes. I'll tell you what is the most interesting, given how often we have discussed this protein. So if you haven't seen this, go look at the 2021 or share it with your viewers, listeners. Of the 10 domains, protein is one of the domains and it has four subdomains. So the first one is try to get most of it from beans and nuts. And then I hope I get all four right, but I'm not sure if I'm going to. Um, when you have dairy, have low fat. You know, when you have fish, try to get the ones that have omega-3s. If you choose to eat meat, try to choose lean meats. Wow. We're, we're going to put this table up on, on the video on YouTube. I know, the, I know the exact image that you're talking about. So, I, I, so that was one thing that really struck me is that I think is different than the past, that they really highlighted four levels of protein. Now, picture the nightmare this actually created for us because we, needed, we wanted to give one score for each domain. Do you get a point or not? And then we decided, well... They're not all really specific about them. Some of them are. So, okay, let's have a point if you are following that. And three quarters of a point if, if you're kind of following it. And a half if you mention it. And zero if you like don't mention it or say do the opposite. So we also had to come up with this scaled point score. But for protein, we, need, we needed one score. And there were four subdomains. And if you're vegan, you're not supposed to have any meat. Like do you... Do you get zero or negative or, or what? Anyway, we had a lot of fun putting together the protein. I'm sure there are other ways to do it. So sadly, this part of our heat map, it ends up being a heat map, which I'm sure you'll share yeah. with your viewers. Green for good and red for bad and yellow for in the middle. But in the protein section, there are sort of these hatch, hatch marks. Um, you know, they didn't address this because you can't address it. In a vegan diet, you're not supposed to have meat. Uh, and in a vegetarian diet, you can have yogurt, but in a vegan one, you can't. And in a vegan one, you don't have fish. And there were a couple other places in the grid where it was just sort of inappropriate because of what the diet is. They wouldn't have even talked about that. So some of the little squares in our grid are missing. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was intellectually, it was a blast, like trying to think at the end of the day, I just want to score from zero to 100. How do I do this and recognize some of the subtle differences. Did anything surprise you or did you already have, based on that, those 10 domains and your understanding of the dietary patterns, did you already have a kind of fair idea where these were going to land? Yeah, no, I, I thought they would land where they did. Uh, the hardest ones are the middle ones. So at the top is dash, medit oh, well, here's a, a quippy one. So we actually had Mediterranean ahead of dash at first when we were just sort of making our lists. And Dash scored higher for two reasons, just a little bit higher. One was Dash is super specific about sodium and Mediterranean is not really specific. And for American Heart, sodium is a big deal for hypertension. Secondly, Mediterranean, you get a point for drinking moderately, but you don't get a point for excessively drinking or abstaining. And Dash, you're not supposed to drink. And the guidelines said to not drink. And so Dash actually came out a little ahead of Mediterranean. And so we had been working with this graphic and then ordering a sequence for a long time. At the end, we had to put Dash ahead of Mediterranean. They were still both the top two. And that was pescatarian and uh, ovo-lacto-vegetarian. And at the end, not surprised, it was keto and paleo because they recommend you exclude so many things that are key for American heart. So whether it's um, fruits or whole grains is, is a big deal for American heart. 
Um, avoiding saturated fat is a big thing for American Heart. So they got dinged on and, and minimizing sodium. Like keto, you, you need some sodium to keep up for part of the ketogenic diet. So they got keto and paleo got dinged quite a bit. They ended up being at the bottom. In the middle were the harder ones. So sort of vegan was in the middle, the vegan higher fat. Uh, low fat was in the middle. Uh, a little below them was the very low fat vegan because American Heart is not into very low fat. They want you to have healthy, unsaturated fat. So vegan, very low fat got dinged and low carb got dinged just because if, as you read through all the papers, they really, oh, you really do need to limit even beans and even whole grains because you'll still get too many carbs. And so those, I think I just said all the yeah. 10 dietary patterns right there. But it was such a blast. And I really, let me go back one more time to this. I, this is probably too much inside baseball and too geeky for you. But, and I really want to thank Christina Peterson if she ever listens to this. This was a tireless job to see all the different diets to represent the 10 patterns, and then clarify, emphasize, lim uh, emphasize, include, limit, or avoid. It's super practical. So as much as I really like our heat map, another thing that was really helpful is if you're a doc, and this document is for, this paper is for docs. They'll have a patient come in saying, doc, I'm on this diet, what do you think? And they're like, I get no training in nutrition. I'm not even sure. What vegan is, I'm not sure what paleo is, I'm not sure what this thing is. Oh, here's the table. That diet says you should emphasize this, you're allowed to include that, you should try to limit that, and you very much should avoid that. Super practical. And we also had to have another twist in the paper. We had to say, this heat map we have of the things that are adherent or not, this is as intended. There's a flip side to this of as followed. So let me give you the quickie there. The vegans who have the white flour tortilla with um, crappy salsa on it and a Coke. It's like, that is, that is not what we meant. And some Oreos. We, yes, and some Oreos. We meant this other thing over here. Or the keto folks who are just eating all meat. Because yes, meat is low in carbs. But the keto diet is 70% fat. And you can't have 30 or 40% protein. You'll throw yourself at a ketogenesis on that. And so we made it clear that there's as intended and as followed, and there's a whole clinical section in there saying, oh, if you're a doc, you might want to ask them these couple extra questions, but very fun project. Do you know what, what could be interesting, and maybe it's an extension of that paper, Okay, is I'm just seeing pra practical implications here. So you, you're in the clinic and you're speaking with your doctor and you say, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying a keto diet or I'm enjoying a, a low-fat vegan diet. It would be nice for the doctor to know, okay, what are the kind of downsides of those dietary patterns and what are the steps to make them healthier? Like, for example, if do you think a keto diet is necessarily or would rank as low if someone, let's say, had a bias for their fats and they were getting it mostly from like fatty fish, avocado, nuts yeah. and seeds? Yeah, it, and it is actually designed in that way. So, And actually, one of the things that we always want to encourage physicians to do is say, you're on keto. I bet you're hardly eating any refined grains or added sugars. Congrats. Oh, my God. That is America's biggest problem. And so from what we've seen, pe folks on keto, they kick butt at getting the added sugars and refined grains out of their diet. I am a little concerned as a clinician about the saturated fat. So have you thought about, you know, where are you getting most of your fat? Have you tried the fatty fish and the avocado and the nuts and seeds type approach. So yeah, it's for the clinician to say, here's the, all of these diets have good things about them. Like if you really, I, I'm pretty sure we have the statement in there. If you looked across all of them, this is my, we agree more than we disagree, love of nutrition. If I could keep saying this message again and again, we all agree, um, more vegetables, more whole foods, less added sugar, less refined grain, all 10 of the diets said those four things. I'm picturing an image from one of your lectures. <laughs> yes. And it's because it's, it's not like, yeah, we already do that already. No, we don't. We hardly eat any vegetables. We hardly eat any whole foods. We eat a crap ton of added sugar and refined grain. Like if all 10 patterns agree on that, 
why don't we have a kumbaya moment and say, yes, let's help America do that. And then maybe later they'll do my kind after that. But all those are big problems in the U.S. diet and maybe globally in many places. And we're not doing very well at making it clear how consistent that message is and making it easy for people to choose foods that are aligned with that. Right. 60% of calories coming from ultra processed foods. Yes, some of the latest data. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So let's let's unpack those misunderstandings. I think it's important for the listeners today to sort of walk away understanding how or why these authors of this review sort of exonerating saturated fat came to the conclusions that they did versus the American College of Cardiology or the European Society of Cardiology guidelines and other reviews which clearly state that reducing exposure to saturated fat uh, rich foods is a good thing for cardiovascular health. You've spoken on this show and on your show at great length about how important context is. Is it simply that this review and people that are claiming saturated fat is not harmful and has been sort of wrongly vilified are, are failing to consider that context? Yeah, I would be more specific than, than context. There are a couple of key principles when looking at really any, any data on nutrition, but with saturated fat in particular, that gets overlooked with this type of argument. So first, let me just preface our entire conversation by saying that dietary patterns rule supreme. I just want to start by stating that because usually these discussions on saturated fat go over all of the technicalities and then they mention that at the very end. And sometimes that gets by the listener from the um, by the listener that seems that seems to that may, may seem like it's an afterthought or something like you know like a detail, but that is absolutely essential. We can look at all these these details and all these these uh, minutia of the research, but at the end of the day, getting the overall dietary pattern right is the ticket. Because if you get that right, that takes care of most of the details, including saturated fat, for the most part. Conversely, if you get the dietary pattern seriously wrong, having the saturated fat in the ideal range is not going to help you much. So I just want to preface with that very important note. Mm. Gil, can you just elaborate on that? I think sometimes we, we may also um, take for granted what dietary pattern means to the mm. average person just kind of tuning in. So when you say dietary pattern, getting it right, and all of this stuff that we're going to talk about, uh, including saturated fat intake tends to take care of itself uh, versus sort of getting it wrong. What is what is a dietary pattern um, that is getting it right versus one that would be getting it wrong? Basically, to summarize, decades, uh, half a century, if not more, of research into the basic pillars that are conserved consistently, consistent and universally agreed upon a diet that is low, or moderate in ultra processed foods, so mainly composed of unprocessed or lightly processed foods, a diet that is rich in unprocessed plant foods, fr fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds, um, and a diet that is low or moderate in added sugar, so refined carbohydrate, alcohol, and added salt. That's basically the gist of it. And even better than that is to just take a look at the Canadian guidelines, they have this great picture. Just one, one look at that image that tells you everything you, you need to know. And if you have a, a diet that, and there's plenty of room for variation. Some people like to eat lower fat. Some people like to eat lower carb. All of that can fit uh, under the umbrella of a healthy dietary pattern. Um, and if you look at that image, you will, you will see that uh, it's, it's virtually impossible to get that spectacularly to get things spectacularly wrong if you're centering things around that that central image right okay cool and to tie that into what we're going to talk about today and really just emphasize something that you have already stated is that when you do that naturally the saturated fatty acid content within the diet is at a level that is not increasing risk of cardiovascular disease yeah basically by following the, those general principles, you're going to be in the in the in the ballpark right now. Can can you overeat 
coconut oil or can you have a little bit too much butter and be a little off off the uh, the 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 key um, hot spot it's possible but you're not going to be all the way on the other end of the spectrum if you have your, your overall dietary pattern right then it's just a matter of tweaking and get the, getting the details um, but that takes care of the vast majority of the of the issues just to to sort of double click on this fatty acids 101 um, and what what fatty acids are and the different types you mentioned essential what is it that makes a fat essential versus a fat that would be described as non-essential yeah so so strictly speaking in nutritional terms an essential nutrient is a nutrient that um the human body can't make but is important for function <clears throat> and the most obvious essential nutrients are many of the vitamins and you know all of the minerals so you know we can't make zinc iron copper selenium etc so they are essential in our diet we have to get them in food and if we don't consume enough of them we can develop a uh, uh you know poor physiology and ultimately a disease that's reflecting essential nutrient uh deficiency so in fatty acids in the fatty acid world there are two classically essential fatty acids so these are fatty acids which we cannot make ourselves one of them is linoleic acid which is an omega-6 fatty acid and the other is alpha linoleic acid which is an omega-3 fatty acid we have to get the amount of those fatty or the amounts of those fatty acids we need from the diet okay and they're made in plants so we get them from seeds nuts vegetable oils and so on so they are the classically essential fatty acids they were discovered um around about a hundred years ago in animal feeding experiments where uh rats were fed fat-free diets and they developed um particular symptoms they didn't grow well they had skin problems they didn't reproduce well and so on and that effect was recovered by providing vegetable oils and that's how the essential fatty acids were discovered now in humans the d- description of essential fatty acid deficiency has been or the diagnosis has been very rare although it has been seen in some particular clinical scenarios and that's probably because most people or all people are consuming enough of the essential fatty acids linoleic and alpha linoleic um so that they don't develop deficiency symptoms and in fact some people argue you know we consume way too much linoleic acid so we're down the other end of the spectrum now <clears throat> there is a subtlety in this term of essential fatty acids because um alpha linoleic acid the essential omega 3 comes from plants can be converted in our bodies to EPA and DHA so these are the long chain highly bioactive omega 3s um but it turns out for various reasons many humans are not very good at making that conversion all the way to DHA so some people use the term essential fatty acid to also include DHA because we can't make it very easily as far as we know um and we know if people consume more DHA in the diet you know they have more DHA in their cells and so on so you know there is an argument that DHA is sort of also essential um and you know that often is stated in the literature mm-hmm. yeah we might come back to that when we mm-hmm. talk about supplementation and vegetarians uh-huh. and vegans who yeah. Yeah. are not consuming fatty fish i think that would be quite relevant there quick one folks i get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. 
what is the reason why conversion is low? ALA to DHA and EPA. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, that's a great question, and um, it's something I've been interested in for quite a long time myself now. So, um, there's a metabolic pathway that takes alpha linolenic acid. So, fatty acids are made are, are carbon chains. Okay. So, alpha linolenic acid has 18 carbons in its chain. Okay, and it has three double bonds within that chain. EPA has 20 carbons, so it's two carbons longer, and has five double bonds in the chain. And DHA has 22 carbons, so it's two carbons longer again, and has six double bonds in its chain. So this conversion from alpha linolenic acid to EPA and then to DHA is a chemical pathway that makes the chain longer and puts more double bonds into the chain, okay? And each of those steps along the pathway, so there are several steps in this pathway, is um, carried out by an enzyme. <clears throat> now, um, those same enzymes that work on alpha-linolenic acid also work on the in the omega-6 pathway, okay? So there's competition between metabolism of omega-3, alpha-linolenic acid, and omega-6 linoleic acid. And um, one reason why the pathway of alpha linolenic acid all the way through to DHA doesn't work so well is because the intake of linoleic acid, its competitor, is much, much higher. Okay, So there are some very nice studies, even studies in humans, where in an experimental setting, people's intake of linoleic acid has been decreased okay so they've been put on a diet where they're consuming less linoleic acid than normal and what happens when you do that is actually you have more appearance of epa particularly in people's blood and blood cells so i think that's a clear indication that this competition between linoleic and alpha linolenic acid so omega-6 and omega-3s is a reality and one reason why the pathway doesn't work very well seems to be that linoleic acid intakes are high. There are, so I think that is a primary reason. There are some other reasons, and one of them is some of the enzymes of that pathway um, are sensitive to insulin. So in people who are less insulin sensitive, so more insulin resistant, um, that pathway doesn't work so well. Also, some of those enzymes have micronutrients as cofactors. So I think micronutrient intake could also influence the pathway. What micronutrients would would be important? Uh, so, so I think zinc and magnesium are important cofactors for some of the enzymes. Um, that hasn't been investigated in humans, and I think, you know, it should be. So I think there are, there are several factors. Um, and then the other one, which I think is really interesting, Simon, is um, it seems that so, – so in humans, all of the relevant comparisons haven't been made, okay? But one comparison that has been made is whether this conversion of alpha linolenic acid all the way through to DHA is different between – young women and young men. And by young, I mean university student age, because that's the age that the study was done in. And it turned out that um, young adult women are much, much better at making their own DHA than young adult men. And it turns out that sex hormones, so I mentioned insulin as a regulator of this pathway, but sex hormones, uh, so estrogen and progesterone, are also regulators of the pathway. And um, physiologically, this makes sense because DHA is really important for brain and eye development and function. And it's really important that early in life, so before we're born and after we're born, that we get enough DHA. And therefore, it makes, I think, some sense that a woman of childbearing age would be able to make at least some of her own DHA so that the 
the baby before it's born and then after it's born isn't at risk of not getting enough DHA. So I think there's a physiological reason for the sex hormone um, effects on, on that pathway. So you see there's sort of, there's physiological actions through hormones, there's nutritional actions through high omega-6 and maybe low micronutrient intakes that might be important. There's probably also some other things related to age, um, which are not really very well defined. So with that in mind, are, are you sort of in the camp that we need to be conscious about not consuming too much omega-6s to the point that it starts to compete with this, the the uh, enzymes that are required to desaturate and elongate um, linoleic acid and alpha uh, linolenic acid, um, or is it about placing more emphasis on a direct source of DHA and EPA in the diet? Yeah, that, uh, that's a great question, and I think it's 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 both of those. So you ask, am I am an Am I in a camp? Um, so I, I think I probably have a foot in, in two camps, but I might have a bigger foot in, in one of those camps, I guess, if you, if you look back. So I think, um, we need, well, I, I think it's more helpful if we, if we consume preformed EPA and DHA. I think that's, that's, that's really important. I've got no doubt about that. Um, but most people, don't do that. So if you look at what the recommendations are in any country, most people are not meeting the recommendations, probably because they're not eating enough um, fish, which, you know, is, is, a, is a choice they make. Um, so if you take not consuming preformed EPA and DHA and put that to one side, okay, that's important, but not everyone is doing that then I think we rely on our metabolism. And that's where this relationship between linoleic and alpha linoleic acid intakes is important. And to optimize our metabolism of alpha linoleic acid through that pathway, one thing we can do is keep an eye on our linoleic acid intake. Now, that can be a little bit tricky because lots of things that contain a lot of alpha lin or you know a reasonable amount of alpha linolenic acid also contain a lot of linoleic acid although that's not universally true so um we need also to think about you know what are good sources of alpha linolenic acid so things like you know flaxseed chia seeds stuff like that i think we need to be thinking about and trying to cut back on the things which are really rich in linoleic acid and don't contain so much alpha linolenic acid. So, you know, some of the vegetable oils like, you know, corn oil, sunflower oil, so on, don't contain much alpha linolenic acid, but they contain a lot of linoleic acid. Right. And just to sort of emphasize something here, you're saying that dietary strategy, emphasizing ALA rich foods that are somewhat not so rich in, in omega 6s. And then de-emphasizing some of these super omega-6 rich foods is a strategy that's more important for someone who is not consuming enough EPA and DHA in the form of fatty fish or supplement. Yep, correct. I think, I think you got it in a nutshell there. I think that's, that, that, that's dead right. Um, so if you're not, um, at the moment for most people, if, if, if particularly fatty fish, <laughs> is not something that they're into. Um, they need to take this alternative approach, which is uh, looking for sources of alpha linolenic acid, uh, particularly where linoleic acid in, uh, content is, is not high. So helping their metabolism out, basically. Okay, true or false? And I know that, that you're well equipped to answer this one. Omega-3 fatty acids are the most important fat for the brain. True. So far, to the best of our knowledge today, they are. And um, this comes from multiple different studies. Um, studies that look at consumption of omega-3 fatty acids as food and also omega-3 fatty acids as supplementation. 
Dean and I published a couple of papers a couple of years ago, looking at multiple different papers that have come out that look at omega-3 supplementation in, um, in two populations. Um, the majority of the studies were done in children and in elderly populations to see whether supplementation improved cognition, cognitive you know, outcomes. Um, and they had different kind of neuropsychological testing. Endpoints, yeah. Endpoints for children versus elderly. And the data wasn't very clear. We don't have very clear outcomes, but there was a trend. There was a trend towards improved cognitive outcomes, both in children and elderly, when they had enough omega-3 fatty acids in their dietary patterns and when they supplemented if they needed it. And when you look at the pathophysiology of, say, let's talk about the elderly population. Um, as it happens, omega-3 fatty acids are necessary for maintaining the infrastructure of the neuron and the neuronal connections. As a matter of fact, 57% of our brain is made up of DHA. And it needs to be replaced on a regular basis. Our reservoir goes down significantly when we don't get enough of it. People always think that we need to eat fat. You know, brain is made out of fat. We need to eat fat. And cholesterol. Yeah. And cholesterol. cholesterol. Yeah, it is made up of fat. You know, when you look at the dry weight of the brain, it's about 50% fat. Um, but the kind of fat matters. We don't need saturated fats. As a matter of fact, our brain doesn't have the capacity to internalize saturated fats or cholesterol. We do make enough cholesterol in the brain, in the neurons that would serve its purpose. But the one kind of fat that we need on a regular basis is the long chain fatty acids, omega-3. And is there a, a kind of amount that you would recommend for people of different ages or, or what, I know that you supplement in your, your life, how do you approach that? Again, the data is not clean. Um, the data is flawed by two factors. We only saw signal later in life and in early life. And it doesn't mean that in midlife it's not beneficial. It's just that in midlife, the the our ability to detect delta our ability to detect change <clears throat> as, as far as cognition is concerned is not good because there's an incredible amount of cognitive reserve which means that our cognitive capacity is good enough that even if there when there's vacillation it's so minimal to not be able to be detected by the tools we have that's a little complicated but midlife we probably are affected significantly by omega-3, but we don't have the tools to detect the change that well. I want to put a, a pin on this comment because I think this is one of the concepts that is not really discussed in all of the different conversations about brain health and health in general. Just because we don't see a signal during midlife about something or when if people feel fine doesn't necessarily mean that we don't lay the foundation of disease during that that period. Sorry, I just wanted to come. Oh, like it's beautiful. Really high. Well, that's that similar point. to so cardiovascular disease. Correct. But even more so for heart, uh, for the brain. Uh, the brain infrastructure, 87 billion neurons, billions and trillions of connections. This is the infrastructure that you're creating after the age of 21. Before that, it's the, it's the cells, growth of cells. In fact, there are some programs, cell death around age five or so, so that uh, you, have, you end up with less cells. But the connections are built thereafter. And much of the connections are related to your environment, how much you're challenged, a bunch of stuff. But also the myelination continues all the way to early 20s. So now you have the, what they call brain capacity. But cognitive capacity, these are arbitrary terms that are created to describe certain things. Cognitive capacity is the connectivity of the neurons, the infrastructure. Imagine a building, a huge building, that's held up by billions of pillars. And so if a few of them are knocked down, nobody sees any difference from outside. Which means cognition hasn't necessarily changed in a way that would be yeah. observable. Observable. The building is functioning. Nobody sees any difference, but the pillars are being knocked down one at a time in, in your 20s. I want this to be emphasized because it's very difficult for us to emphasize brain health to younger people. We're writing a third book and, and a huge segment of it, actually more than a third, is around children and, and young adults and their brain capacity. And those pillars are foundational. We're knocking them down or building them in our 20s. So everything you eat, every, your exercise, everything determines those pillars. So the, the pillars are knocked down, knocked down, knocked down. And then in your 60s, 
Now there are enough pillars knocked down where you start seeing the wavering. So I think in that example, you, were, you, you mentioned a building, so a pillars yes. in, in a building, right? And so that building falling down is sort of synonymous with cognition um, impairment, right? Correct. Being observable. Now you can take a peek into that building. You could do an inspection and notice, okay, some of these pillars are, have been knocked down. Yes. We, we might want to get on the front foot here before this thing falls down. Yes. And <clears throat> maybe that's something we'll come back to because I, I know a lot of people will be interested in, okay, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 40. What can I measure? What are my, are there biomarkers or tests or scans that I can do in my brain that will tell me, hey, you're on the, you're on the road to Parkinson's or you're on the road to Alzheimer's dementia or Huntington's, whatever it may be? I think it's the most critical topic that we should be speaking about because it's in our, in our 30s that it's not just that we're avoiding disease, but we're actually building capacity. Yes. That's been our focus in the last few years. Uh, it's not just Alzheimer's, but younger people. The, how do you t get the signals to the young people to show that, oh, look, you're losing some capacity here or you're gaining capacity? That's, that's something because if you don't have those markers, people are not motivated. Motivation is, 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 a, is a complex thing when, you, when your life is driven by other factors when you're younger. But it's, that's when it starts, especially when it comes to your brain. Um, and, and, and it's foundational. So now when we looked at the data with omega-3, one of the factors, just one of many, um, we, we didn't see any, most of the papers came back negative because the population they had included were younger people. The, we didn't have the tools of detecting signal, but we know that it affects them as much if not more. What we did see signal, and I'm gonna get to the dosage, was later in life, or even pre-dementia patients called MCI, or mild cognitive impairment patients, which have a mire, much higher proclivity for dementia. And these populations, you did see an effect. Omega-3 did have an effect, DHA, and it was at higher doses. And the second flaw with a lot of studies were they, they never saw signal because the doses were lower. Dosage problem, and we were gonna talk about uh, uh, other uh, studies that with choline and other things where the dosage comes to us from many years ago accidentally, but nobody focused at dose studies. They were looking at effect studies. So in that population, the higher doses were the, the, the dose that saw signal, 1,000 milligrams, 1,500 milligrams. So um, it's, it's not definitely not definitive as far as the dose, but we went on the higher dose as far as omega-3 is concerned. One of the other things I've thought about those trials, but it goes across nutrition trials in general, is the importance of knowing someone's baseline levels of DHA or APA that in the study, um, because you could give everyone one gram of DHA EPA, but the levels achieved at an individual level through that study are going to be vastly different. And so another approach would be to somehow personalize the dose for each participant to achieve a given DHA or omega-3 index and then to say, okay, well, if you get to X percent, uh, like five, six percent omega-3 index, whatever dose that is for you, personalized dose, then you're going to have lower risk. It would be another way of looking at it. Absolutely. I think we're learning more and more that not everybody achieves a particular level if they're given a particular dose. Um, from the studies done in uh, the APOE4 um, allele population. So say, for example, if ha someone has one copy of apolipoprotein uh, 4, which is has been associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, they've seen that when they have APOE4, they don't necessarily transport DHA as much as non-APOE4 allelic uh, participants do. So that nuance and that personalization depends on so many different factors. Are we there yet? No, we're not. We don't know. We don't have enough data to be able to prescribe and personalize a specific nutritional pattern or whatever whatever needs that a person um, has for preventing Alzheimer's disease. And to tie this concept to the question that you asked before, like what do people, what do, what should people do? Like you're a younger person and now you know a lot about brain health. Where do you start from? What kind of biomarkers are there? So 
the answer to that question is it has multiple tiers, right? So generally speaking, just the awareness that you have to take care of your lifestyle, what you eat, how you move, how you sleep, how you keep your mind active is very important. And that should be spread out as far as, you know, in the form of a public health announcement is concerned. And then going deeper into more personalized um, and more detailed and more nuanced approaches to personalized uh, medicine for brain health is concerned, there, there are some flaws in there. You know, there are some companies and some physicians who are kind of taking this way too far and extrapolating way beyond the data and recommending things that are not really based well into science. But um, we have enough data as far as vascular risk markers are concerned. So for example, if you have blood pressure, high blood pressure, and that blood, high blood pressure is, believe it or not, anything over 120 millimeters of mercury for systolic and anything above 80 millimeters of mercury, the diastolic. If your blood pressure is one tw- over 120 over 80, that's a problem. Which is a lot of people. Huge. A lot of people. I think the numbers are crazy. Even in, in the United States, I'll stick to our country, in the United States... People between the ages of 18 to 39, 24, 25% of them have high blood pressure. Just just think about that. They need to be on a medication, right? So those are easily modifiable things. Not, I I shouldn't say easily, you know, for some people, it might actually be related to some underlying disorder that may need some treatment or something of that nature. So knowing your blood pressure, knowing your LDL cholesterol, we've talked about this in the past, high LDL has been correlated with cognitive impairment and cognitive decline during midlife as well as later on in life. Making sure that people understand what their hemoglobin A1C is, which is a marker of glucose metabolism, what their fasting glucose monitor is. That doesn't mean everybody should be wearing a continuous glucose monitor, but, you know, having an idea of what your glucose metabolism is, cholesterol is, blood pressure is, making sure that your vitamin B12 levels are checked, making sure that your vitamin D levels are checked. Those are some of the surface level, easily modifiable risk factors that are available now. And then when it comes to, say, for example, omega-3 fatty acid metabolism, knowing your APOE4 status, and even going deeper down into things like, how does my body metabolize vitamin D? Do I have enough vitamin, active vitamin D available for my brain to use it, to think better, to function better? Those are a little more you know, nuanced things that are available. But I always fear of you know, some of these companies taking advantage of people and selling them things that are not really based on science so far. I think that may be lost on some people. So in those three cohorts, that's for nurses' health study one, nurses' health study two, and the health professionals' follow-up study, there's biochemical analysis. Right. Yes, and subsets of the population that could not begin to afford to do biochemical analysis on several hundred thousand people, but we on subsets of the population. But that allows you to say, okay, we can... We can essentially get a very objective idea of of this person's nutrient status or hormones or whatever it may be, and then we can use that to determine is the information we're getting about their diet likely to be accurate. Right, exactly. Okay. So let's go over the the major findings that you've you've, uh, unearthed over the years from these cohorts, and I appreciate some of that's going to overlap with what we kind of led with at the start of this conversation, but... High level, what are, I guess, the the most interesting things that you've observed? Probably the most interesting and important from a public health standpoint of what we've done has been the type of fat in the diet being important. And at the beginning of our work, the common belief and the base of the national dietary recommendations and even global recommendations uh, was that all fat is bad. And the dietary recommendations were to eat a lot of carbohydrate and keep fat intake as low as possible. And that was really the, the, the message from our dietary pyramid that we had at that time. And so we've looked at total fat intake in relation to many different outcomes, and we've just not seen any important association with total fat in the diet. Uh, and uh, the total fat versus total carbohydrate just seems to be 
not important. But the type of fat has turned out to be extremely important. And uh, Ansel Keys did suggest that that might be the case. And, uh, but he did miss some important pieces, including trans fat, that that is the most harmful type of fat in the diet, uh, worse than saturated fat, considerably worse than saturated fat. And we did see that show up quite early in our study, even by 1993. We published in the Lancet that there was an increased risk of heart disease. That's been confirmed in other cohort studies and in over a dozen controlled randomized feeding studies, trans fat was harmful. So, Is that because of its effect on lipids or is there multiple kind of mechanisms? Uh, trans fat seems to definitely has adverse effects on blood lipids and uniquely adverse effects on blood lipids. It's the only type of fat that raises LDL and reduces HDL in, in the blood, but it also increases inflammatory factors, and it looks like it probably increases insulin resistance as well. And inflammation and insulin resistance are very intertwined, so it's, it's more than just an effect on so blood lipids. Worst. So that's the worst of the fats. And then the unsaturated fats actually being beneficial compared to carbohydrate intake uh, with uh, polyunsaturated fat being uh, strongly uh, beneficial. And again, we've known from the time of Ansel Keys that polyunsaturated fat re reduces LDL cholesterol or total cholesterol in the diet, but it's clear now that it does much more than that too. It also uh, reduces insulin resistance, and reduces inflammation uh, as well. So uh, polyunsaturated fat being very beneficial. In fact, I think the, the biggest single reason, and there were multiple reasons for the decline in heart disease in this country, was about doubling of polyunsaturated fat in the diet from the 1960s. Uh, and then monounsaturated fat looked to be sort of neutral or maybe beneficial. And what we've seen with further follow-up that monounsaturated fat compared to uh, carbohydrate is beneficial if it's monounsaturated fat from plant oils, but not from animal sources. And of course, uh, uh, beef fat and dairy fat has a fair amount of monounsaturated fat in it as well. But it, it, it's probably more than just the uh, type of fat. It's probably the plant oils are coming with a lot of antioxidants and other phytochemicals along with it. But anyway, what we see is that the Type of fat is very important, and uh, fortunately, with on the basis of this evidence, uh, partial hydrogenation has been outlawed now in the United States and many other countries. In fact, by the time we got around to outlawing, it was almost already gone, already that there had been enough information out that even the manufacturers who resisted uh, at first the information, but they, they finally came aboard and took trans fat out of their products. So yes, I think type of fat has had a uh, it's been really interesting biology. It's been interesting, challenging epidemiology, uh, and, but, and also has a very huge public health impact. I think a great summary of some of that is in this graph that you did with Frank Hu, which I'll, I'll put on screen if anyone's watching on, on YouTube. Um, but one point there, so I think we just really underline this for people, is that a healthy diet does not have to be low total fat. Quality yeah. of the fat is really important. And what I heard you say is that these polyunsaturated fats in particular seem to be inherently beneficial. So how do you, how do you feel about, I guess it's, 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 it's still common to see some people advocating for a low-fat diet for cardiovascular disease. How do you feel about that? Yeah, right. Uh, I guess opinions change slowly over <laughs> humans. It's something hardwired into us that uh, people have a hard time uh, changing their beliefs based on even uh, strong evidence as it emerges. So I, I think the, for a long time, it wasn't just the public, but the prevention world, the medical world, was they were really pushing low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets. Uh, and it took quite a while for them to change. And But they, by this time, I think it, that's almost universally uh, uh, changed. But there's still lags, people out on the front lines uh, working with patients uh, often don't have good access to information. And of course, the internet still confuses people. Um, there's, there's lots of just noise out there about diet that I think slows down um, evidence-based change. Right. Fortunately, it's, it's, it's now quite clear in the cardiovascular prevention guidelines and um, the information 
that you're speaking to is becoming more and more available to clinicians. So um, it is available for people to find if they want to, if they have the time. Right. <laughs> Hey friends, if you'd like to stay connected and reinforce the valuable insights from this show, let's connect on Instagram. You can find me at Simon Hill. That's at Simon Hill. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's dive back into the episode. You, you mentioned there that the doubling of the polyunsaturated fats has likely contributed to, I believe, the reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality. That, and you can look at a curve, you can look at the, as the cardiovascular disease mortality has gone down, plant oil consumption has gone up. But yet there are some people who are set on pointing the finger at vegetable oils and seed oils and you know canola oil, for example, and saying that these are actually harmful, they're inflammatory, they contribute to disease. And that typically is is really directed at, at omega-6 lin linoleic acid. And I'm sure that's something that you've seen. Why do you think that idea exists? That's a good question. I've been asking <laughs> colleagues, where does this idea come about that seed oils and omega-6 are harmful? And I, I think it uh, the person really who was pushing that for quite a while was Artemis Simopoulos, uh, whose work you may have come across. But actually, she really didn't do any work. It, I looked, I've read her papers, and there's no evidence, there's no research that she's done on this. It, the, it, the idea, I think, comes from the fact that uh, we eat, uh, our main omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids in the diet are 18 carbons long, and those uh, fatty acids, uh, omega-6 and omega-3, are elongated and desaturated uh, and become inflammatory or anti-inflammatory factors. Uh, and the idea is that they omega-6s uh, compete against the elongation and desaturation of omega-3 fatty acids. And it's uh, believed, and there's evidence that omega-3 fatty acids have anti-inflammatory effects. And so uh, there must be competition there. And if omega-3s are good, omega-6s must be bad. I think that's the extent of the information or the, the hypothesis here. But this ignores the fact, uh, several facts, that omega-3 fatty acid levels are elongated to arachidonic acid, and the body really wants that uh, because I, it, it's been staring me in the face for decades, but the amount of omega arachidonic acid in the blood as a percent of fatty acids is about 20 times higher than the amount in our diet. So uh, our body really wants to have a lot of arachidonic acid and, it's, uh, and regulates that very tightly. So these are not unregulated pathways. And arachidonic acid is really important. It's a, uh, uh, it's a very major part of our central nervous system and involved in, uh, uh, in, in, anti in the inflammatory pathways that uh, fight uh, infections, for example. So these are tightly regulated pathways. They're not uh, just allowed to compete directly with each other. But more importantly, uh, that polyunsaturated omega-6 uh, polyunsaturates have many other functions as well that uh, they uh, downregulate NF-kappa B, which is an inflammatory pathway, and they also are ligand for PPAR gamma, which uh, is an insulin sensitizer as well. So it's pretty clear that replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat reduces insulin resistance and, and diabetes risk as well. So I think it, there's a mistake just to look at by the human biochemistry and biology is really complicated, and to look just at one pathway and uh, uh, so on this hypothetical reason make dietary recommendations, I think that's where it's coming from. But there are now dozens of studies that show that omega-6 fatty acids are not pro-inflammatory. They're, uh, in, a, in a number of the studies, they're actually anti-inflammatory. Uh, so we need both, omega-6 and omega-3. They're both essential. And uh, if we only had omega-6 polyunsaturates, that wouldn't be a good situation either. We, ne we need both of them. And uh, the exact uh, uh, balance is not totally cr uh, clear, but uh, we have a, up to about 8% polyunsaturates, omega-6 in our diet. Taiwan is about, when I looked, about the highest, at about 15%. 
So we've looked, we can't, at some point, uh, almost everything will start to become bad or too much, but we don't see that within our population. Yeah, I think it's become a bit of a scapegoat almost. I've seen some people point to ultra processed foods and say it's the linoleic acid. That's the one thing that is obesogenic. But you know, even if you look at the research on obesity, and I saw a really interesting paper in Circulation, I'll put this on screen as well, that did a biochemical analysis and actually looked at linoleic acid in serum and in adipose tissue. You've probably seen this. You might even be an author on this paper. <laughs> I'm not sure. But they they saw an inverse relationship. So the higher the linoleic uh, acid adip adipose tissue levels, the lower total mortality. Yeah, men lower diabetes, lower cardiovascular risk to all. And we've also looked at weight gain too, that there was actually less weight gain with uh, higher linoleic acid intake. But you're right, it's, it's, it's amazing how these myths develop and get propagated on the internet. Okay, so here we're talking about the importance of the type of fat and if you're sort of downshifting on saturated fats, including more polyunsaturated fats, which in, from a food perspective would look like, I guess, less fatty cuts of meat and butter and, and more nuts and seeds and legumes and fatty fish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's really the the right way to look at it is on the, the whole food basis because that that's what we eat and that integrates all the other components that come along with these nutrients. And so, from a mechanistic point of view, is the primary reason that's beneficial for the person that's making those changes the effect on LDL cholesterol, or there are a variety of mechanisms that are at play when you swap saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats? Uh, definitely a variety of mechanisms. The LDL cholesterol in itself would be important, but there are also these uh, uh, insulin sensitizing issues, uh, anti-inflammatory issues, and probably some other mechanisms that are not totally clear to us yet. Tell me about the the position statement and your role at the ah, AHA. So yeah. you're you're the chair of the nutrition committee. Yeah. So the American Heart Association has like 15 different uh, councils. One of them is the Lifestyle Council, and the Lifestyle Council has an obesity committee and an exercise committee and something else and a nutrition committee. Although to be honest, the nutrition committee is pretty old. It goes back many decades, so it might have even. The nutrition committee was there before there was a lifestyle council. But anyway, that's where it lives. I'm the current chair. Uh, it's a two-year role for your vice chair for two, and then your chair for two, and then your past chair for two. So it's sort of like a, a six-year role. And their main, one of, the, one of the main things they do is they write scientific advisory statements about whatever the American heart has been getting from the general public that they're confused about. So, oh, is it fish? Oh, is it seed oils? Oh, is it saturated fat? Oh, is it ultra processed foods? So whatever the public's confused about, they come to the committee and say, you know, which ones of these, what kind of expertise do you have now? So we have about 10 members on the committee. We have a whole bunch of liaisons from other councils that sit in and we vote and we do at least one paper, sometimes two a year. And the year before us, Alice Lichtenstein, who's been doing a lot of papers from Tufts for HA forever, she had in 2006 sort of written an overview of American Heart dietary guidelines. And they hadn't been updated since then. And you know, the dietary guidelines for Americans get updated every five years. So she said 15 years, that's, that's long enough. Let's update them and see if there's anything new. So their job was to look at all the evidence for cardiac arrest, sudden heart disease, stroke, uh, myocardial infarction. So they were looking at all the heart outcome data and all the diet studies that existed. And they said, given that there's 10 domains and here are the 10 domains of what we think, here's the things you should um, emphasize and here's the things you should avoid. Characteristics of a heart healthy diet. Characteristics of a heart healthy diet. And again, they did the evidence, uh, you know, which trials, which, what's observational, what's an RCT, randomized clinical trial. So then people said, okay, well, those are all the domains, but does that mean I can eat paleo? Does that mean I can eat vegan? And they said, so there's an opportunity here to do a, a follow up paper just based on patterns. 
Um, I've actually been part of the U.S. News and World Report rankings for the last few years, and the 2022 one, they had 40 patterns. I've seen that. The Mediterranean or Dash diet's usually one. It always two. wins, yeah, and keto always loses. But it's amazing how many patterns there are, and I, I've actually had a frustration working with them thinking, you know, you keep asking me to go through this full list of 40 diets and say what evidence there is for each one of these, and what often happens is there's spin-offs of the diets. So let's take the low-fat vegan diet, for example. So Dean Ornish has promoted that. Caldwell Esselstein promotes that. Caldwell Esselstein's son has a diet called like Pritikin, Fire Engine 2. Yeah. No, but fi- have you ever heard of like the Fire Engine Yeah, I know. Uh, so Rip Esselstein. Yeah, Rip yeah. Esselstein. Yeah. Is the Pritikin diet also a low-fat? Yeah, and the Pritikin diet is, is in that list, but it's so the, I don't have any evidence for the Fire Engine 2 diet, but it's basically Dean Ornish's diet. And so when they say, is there evidence for this? I feel like saying there is, but it's not when it's called that. It's when it's called something else. So I don't think there should be 40 diets. And so this is one of our first jobs. How many patterns really are there? And we wanted to get things that get rid of. We excluded things that uh, like Weight Watchers didn't count because there's it's not so much what you eat. It's a pattern. It's a you get points for things. Uh, Whole thirty is like a, a sort of a crunch diet that you're doing for a while. It's not long term, life term. So we we excluded a bunch of those, and we ended up with ten diets. And it basically started with Dash, but we also sort of thought Baltic Nordic diet. If you look at those, they're pretty similar to Dash and Mediterranean, and then there was the slew of veggie diets. So there's pescatarian, and then let's do the ovos. Ovo alone, lacto alone, ovo lacto, vegetarian, or vegan with no ovo and no lacto. But I was very clear, I wanted to have two two vegan diets. One is very, very low fat vegan, and one is more of a Mediterranean high fat vegan, and standard low carb, standard low fat, paleo, and keto. And when we're talking about these diets, we're talk we're we're talking about focus on whole foods. Yes, whole foods. And here's another part of the fun of it was so uh, so when we do these papers for your American Heart, there's a writing group, and so you're supposed to represent North, South, East, West. You're supposed to try the best you can to get Black, White, Asian, Hispanic. You're supposed to get men and women. You're t- clinicians and non clinicians, PhDs in the writing group. On the committee. You're- on, the, on the writing group. So we have 10 people in the writing group, which can't represent every one of those cells, but it's quite a diverse group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Christina Peterson was a star from this. She's now at Tufts. Um, Maya Vadivalu was my uh, co-chair on this. The fun part at the beginning was like, how many patterns are there? And then how are you going to say what the patterns are? And so what we did is, this is not a systematic review. We did not find every paper under the sun that had said this. But for, let's say, paleo or keto or vegan or Mediterranean or DASH, we went and found five or six papers that said, this is what we studied. And then we looked what they said they were doing. And it wasn't just what you emphasized or avoided. Super proud of this. And it was not my idea. I'm pretty sure this is Christina's idea or maybe Maya's idea. So we have a whole ton of supplement papers, one for each diet, that says, okay, here's the five studies or six studies, and here's what they said to emphasize, here's what you could include, here's what you're encouraged to limit, but you don't have to completely avoid, and you really have to avoid this. So each one was defined defined by four categories. And when we looked at all the papers that said they were Mediterranean or low-fat or whatever, they weren't consistent. They weren't entirely consistent. And we were very specifically looking at the 10 domains of the 2021 paper that Alice Lichtenstein wrote. But our job was, if these are the 10 domains, how consistent are the patterns with the 10 domains? So we had to find the papers to see how they defined them. And let me just give you one tricky one is, dairy and Mediterranean is a little gray. I know a Mediterranean diet score that dings you for eating dairy. And I know a Mediterranean diet score that gives you a point for having yogurt, right? Mm. So it's there isn't one Mediterranean diet? Right, that's interesting. So when you're looking at the evidence or a study, it's like, which Mediterranean diet is it? 
Yeah, I really think if you get the Greeks and the Turks and the Moroccans and the French in one room, it could be a fist fight. Like, no, 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 mine <laughs> is the Mediterranean. Bat. No, it isn't. It's, it's a thing. It's a pattern. And that, that's the challenge with patterns is there's a lot of wiggle room. And the benefit is, oh, if you're following this pattern, it allows you some flexibility. At a high level here, so we're talking about atherosclerosis, which is the buildup of this fatty plaque in the, in the artery wall. Um, is that the, the most common cause of cardiovascular disease? Yeah, it, the word cardiovascular disease is a humongous category. There's so many afflictions that can affect the heart and the blood vessels. But the most frequent one that we see all the time, the one that is putting people in the CCU or God forbid in the graveyard, the bypass unit, is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And notice I didn't say coronary artery disease because atherosclerosis can occur in several of the arteries that carry blood in our body, our neck, our brain, our abdominal organs, our peripheral legs and extremities. All of those can build up these plaques that lead to all sorts of uh, bad things. It doesn't include cardiomyopathies and uh, arrhythmia is not caused by ischemic disease or congenital diseases. There's so many uh, uh, immense field of cardiology and cardiological diseases. Tonight, we're talking about the most common one. So you mentioned before that there are a number of risk factors that have been established. So at a high level, when it comes to atherosclerosis, if we're thinking about what is increasing our risk, what are the, the sort of the top handful of risk factors that would contribute to the development of that fatty plaque buildup? And we should say there's really two things we're looking at. One are risk factors. They're pretty much, if they're abnormal, they're causal of the disease. And then there's a bunch of things we call risk marker that would add to whatever risk that the risk factors outline but they're not treatable per se. Risk factors, because they're causal, if there is a therapy, they're treatable. So to do the best risk assessment, we use both risk factors and there are numerous risk markers and you put them together and at least in their blood tests, their biomarkers, uh, we have a pretty good idea what we're dealing with. We have other tools to further elucidate the extent of a is there atherosclerotic disease present or not, but risk factors and then risk markers are the everyday tools readily available throughout the world, for the most part, rather cheap. Right. And so some of these are things like high blood pressure, um, elevated LDL cholesterol. Smoking probably leads the list. So uh, if you smoke, good luck to you. you you're, you're subjecting your body likely to a lot of things. So uh, we take that out of the picture. We're not going to discuss that tonight. The others, high blood pressure and lipid disturbances or two and three or three and two, however what you want to list them. And if either of those have abnormalities there with the tests we use to make that hypertension or lipid diagnosis, they require serious treatment. Uh, look, there's things we can't do anything about. Male gender is a bigger risk factor until later in life, then females take over, but men do get heart attacks younger for the most part than women. So things like that. Age is a major risk factor. I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> well, there, there are some people that are, that are working on that. I believe. Yeah, no, <laughs> my good buddy, Peter, at the is sure trying. Yeah, but yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, the focus of this is, is on lipids, our conversation anyway, um, which as you mentioned is a, can be a major uh, risk factor when there are disturbances. I think for people to appreciate the disturbances, first we have to understand the system. We have to understand what are lipids, um, how our body transports these and what the purpose of that system is. So perhaps we can start there. Yeah, you absolutely have to start there because the lipids I mean, how many times have I said that in my life? But many of the average layman may not even know what a lipid is if he was asked on the street, hey, what's a lipid? Uh, so a lipid is basically an organic molecule. Organic molecule means it's carbon and hydrogen atoms that are all stuck together in various configurations. But it's an organic molecule that is not soluble in water. So, and the simplest thing is, hey, take olive oil, take a glass of water, 
pour it together and the olive oil doesn't freely mix. My joke is, hey, if I did doers in water, scotch in water, <laughs> they're very missable. You couldn't, there's no droplets in that glass. So lipids are not soluble. And this presents, so any molecule that is not soluble in water is under the lipid classification. Now it's a family of a lot of different molecules and the ones we're going to spend most of the, the time on in our podcast are going to be sterols. And the most common sterol is cholesterol. And then the fatty acids. And the fatty acids usually are part of a lipid called phospholipids or triacylglycerol, triglycerides. So those are mostly the lipids that we're going to be talking about. How in the world are they related to cardiovascular risk or uh, atherogenesis, the buildup of plaque? So that's what lipids are. And with that simple introduction, here's the whole darn dilemma. There's no human life without lipids. We need fatty acids for energy. We absolutely need cholesterol for our cell membranes. They provide integrity and the ability for membranes to signal no cholesterol, no cell membranes, no cells, no podcast tonight if you and I weren't constructed of cells. So cholesterol also is a precursor to several hormones that are necessary for life. And cholesterol is the substance from which the liver makes bile acids. And if it didn't make them, we couldn't absorb anything and we'd be in a bad way too. So cholesterol is so crucial that evolution knew we have to give every cell in the body the ability to manufacture, synthesize cholesterol. And we also have to maybe develop a lipid transportation system that could track lipids, the energy carrying lipids like triglycerides, uh, and even cholesterol, if needed, to a tissue that says, hey, I need cholesterol, it has to go from where cholesterol is being produced to somebody who wants to use it. And that is the problem, because plasma is our vehicle, how we transport things in the human body. And plasma is pretty much a total aqueous water solution. So if the liver or any other tissue is making lipids, it just can't dump them in the plasma, no more than you can pour olive oil in that glass of water. So evolution, which solves a lot of problems, said way early, whenever it started and whatever species it started, we have to develop a lipid transportation system for humans so lipids can go here, there, and everywhere, or perhaps brought back to an organ that can get rid of excess lipids that are not needed. So all that was necessary was the chemistry realization that if you stick lipids on a protein, proteins for the most part are water soluble, if I have a collection of lipids bound to a protein, that is a lipid transportation vehicle. And obviously, you would call that a lipoprotein because it consists of lipids and a protein or more than one protein. So our body was given the ability to produce lipid-carrying molecules called a lipoprotein. And two organs were blessed with the ability to make lipoproteins, our intestine, because as you can imagine, we're absorbing lipids from the gut lumen and into the intestine. But for the intestine to send those lipids to where they might be needed, it has to wrap them with a protein and then secrete that protein into the systemic circulation. So the intestine can make a lipoprotein. And the only other organ that can make a lipoprotein is basically our master <laughs> chemical control system called the liver, which like, makes everything we pretty much need in the body. So if the liver can take collections of lipids, wrap it with a protein and secrete it into the plasma. So here, all of a sudden, we've got these spherical large particles carrying various uh, lipid components, and they can go and bring lipids to whatever cell might need them. And if that cell needs a lipid, it would upregulate a receptor that internalizes the lipoprotein with its content. But equally important is if a cell had too much lipids, and look, too many fatty acids, <laughs> inflammation, if it's the liver, fatty liver, too much cholesterol in any cell in your body will crystallize and kill that cell. So once a cell has above a very slight threshold of cellular cholesterol, it has to get rid of it. Now, that cell just can't pump it out into the blood. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. it has to pump it out into a lipid-carrying vehicle, and that would be a lipoprotein. So cells that have excess lipids can say, hey, Mr. Lipoprotein, please take this from me, and please take it to somewhere that can use it 
or eliminate it from the body. So lipids, cholesterol and triglycerides that I have spoken about, are trafficked within these little circulating fat protein and wrapped fat balls called lipoproteins. But lipoproteins take lipids in a forward direction from the intestine or liver to various cells or in a reverse direction from cells back to the liver and say, you deal with it. Uh, and the liver is very skilled at handling excess lipids, eliminating them or changing them into other things. There could be some side uh, trips if a lipoprotein is carrying triglycerides, which is basically a, a form of energy because there's three fatty acids on it, which if oxidized will create ATP. That lipoprotein could stop at a triglyceride storage organ called adipocytes. Our fat cells would say, oh, I'm happy to take some of the triglycerides and I'll keep them here until uh, uh, the body needs them again and then I'll release them. And uh, you could, a lipoprotein could bring especially cholesterol, not triglycerides, to those steroidogenic organs I talked about, uh, cholesterol being a precursor to several hormones. So the adrenal cortex sometimes needs cholesterol from a lipoprotein. Our uh, gonads sometimes needs cholesterol from a lipoprotein to synthesize the various things they're doing. So you can see lipoproteins, it's the lipid transportation system, and there could be several pit stops along the way. As we get into this, what's fun is what makes a lipoprotein go there, 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 and it's all regulated by a variety of enzymes and receptors. It's such a fascinating little system we have, but it's basically the lipid transportation system. And my famous words, I've said it a million times, lipids go nowhere in the human body unless a lipoprotein brings them there. Of course, unless the cell is synthesizing its own lipids, but... Uh, and that happens pretty much with cholesterol, but not so much. Only a few organs can synthesize triglycerides. Trigs have to be delivered to the organs that need energy. Okay. So these lipoproteins are essentially transport vehicles for the triglycerides and for the cholesterol, which are unable to transport to move through circulation unless they're attached to this protein. That's what makes them so. One more little caveat there. These particles, I've talked about the protein, I've talked about triglycerides and cholesterol, but these are fat balls and there is a one molecule layer surface on every one of these particles. And that's where this class of lipids I've mentioned comes in, phospholipids. Now, phospholipids are as crucial as is cholesterol for the construction of cell membranes in the body. Most of the phospholipids are pretty much made in the intestine or the liver. So in the liver or the intestine, when it makes these particles, it wraps them with phospholipids. And so another thing these uh, lipoproteins can deliver is phospholipids to where they are needed. We never talk about that in lipidology because we measure triglycerides on everybody. We measure various cholesterol metrics on everybody. Nobody measures phospholipids, but they're a super integral part of this whole lipid transportation story. Hey friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide, plant-based ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne, and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. So we've spoken a lot about ApoB, Tom, and uh, most uh, sort of basic uh, lipid panels as you said, we'll measure total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Is is ApoB a better measurement, a better predictor of, of cardiovascular disease if someone's wondering about that and whether they should go to the effort or cost of, of ordering that? And, and also, where does non-HDL kind of come into this conversation? Yeah. So look, ApoB is the ball game. ApoB is the signature of the particle it's carrying cholesterol it's going to induce atherogenesis particle number is the primary driving force in the artery wall so apob would be the best test you could absolutely do it's rather cheap and look in the united states it's available in every lab and your cash price is 10 bucks yeah you know labs 
you know, if labs could say, oh, I want 90 bucks for it, but most labs will give you a cash price. Third party payers often say, no, I'm not paying for that. That's an experimental test, even though <laughs> it's not an experimental test. The data is overwhelming on it. So if you can't, for whatever reason, get an APOB, and I've gotten emails back, hey, I'm in Canada, I can't get an APOB, and perhaps other countries in the world, maybe you have to see a specialist before you get APOB. I don't know. But so if you're stuck with a lipid panel, the only reason you're doing a lipid panel is twofold. There's one lipid concentration that you have to know, and that's triglycerides. For two reasons, there are two types of triglyceride disorders. One where the triglycerides is well above 500. That's a rare genetic disorder. If you have that, the mission in life is lower the triglycerides to prevent pancreatitis, not heart disease. Then there's everybody else who has a triglyceride less than 500. Most typically, they're diabetics or insulin-resistant people. And most typically, their triggers are in the 140, 150 range, not 400. And in those, ApoB becomes the goal of therapy. So triglycerides is important to exclude the rare hypertriglyceridemic disorders. Everything else in the lipid panel is just a poor man's guesstimate of ApoB, a poor man's surrogate of ApoB. So let's start with the total cholesterol level. Total cholesterol is the cholesterol in every lipoprotein in your plasma. LDL cholesterol plus VLDL cholesterol plus HDL cholesterol. Normally, we're doing fasting, so there are no chylomicrons contributing to cholesterol levels because they disappear rapidly postprandially. So here's the trick, though. So if you get a total cholesterol level, 80% of that cholesterol is in your LDL particles. And what is an LDL? It's an ApoB particle. So total cholesterol is a super poor man's surrogate guesstimate of ApoB. At what level should you be concerned? Above 200, you've got a definite serious ApoB level. I personally think above 150, you want to run out and get an ApoB test to see where it is. So 150 to 200 would cer should certainly suggest to a clinician or a patient, you've got hyperbeta lipoproteinemia, too many ApoB particles. All right, let's jump to the test everybody talks about, LDL cholesterol. Well, remember, 90% of your ApoB particles are LDLs. So obviously, LDL cholesterol has a pretty high correlation with your ApoB level, far higher than does total cholesterol. So if I see you have an elevated LDL cholesterol, should I just assume, hey, you're an ApoB uh, issue here and we're going to take care of it? No, because as good as it correlates, there are exceptions to the rule where the LDL cholesterol is quite low, but your ApoB is still high, or conversely, your LDL cholesterol is high, but your ApoB is normal. Those situations are said, hey, the two laboratory metrics are discordant. Normally, they agree with one another. They're concordant. So when you discover a, a discordance between ApoB and LDL cholesterol, Trial after trial after trial has shown risk follows ApoB better than it does LDL cholesterol. So therefore, I don't want people coming up to me and telling me, oh, Tom, you're going to be so proud of me. I got a great LDL cholesterol level. Great. What's your ApoB? Oh, I don't know. Then don't even talk to me until you go get an ApoB. If your ApoB is also low, but if your LDLC is super and your ApoB is high, you have a risk that is not identified by LDL cholesterol. I'm one of the authors on a paper in diabetics where LDL cholesterol is 50, and about 20% of them still had high LDL particle concentrations. And yet they would be told, hey, your LDL cholesterol is 50. You have no worries whatsoever. Wrong. Discordance. All right, the final. Now, well, let's get HDL cholesterol out of the picture here. That's on every lipid panel. Tragically, for years, it was called the good cholesterol. We know now that's an idiotic terminology. Uh, so what is HDL cholesterol? Well, it's the cholesterol that's in all your HDL particles. Now, HDLs are not the cholesterol, they're not the lipoproteins who crash your artery wall and dump cholesterol. There's no ApoB on them. So they're not, per se, part of the atherogenic uh, uh, milieu that causes the disease. But 
Framingham, when it first came out, said, geez, people with, and that's an epidemiological study in the United States, people with low HDL cholesterol seem to be rather high risk for atherosclerotic disease. And study, Mr. Fit came in and other epidemiologic studies seem to confer that, that, yeah, LDL cholesterol is worrisome, but if your HDL cholesterol is low, it doesn't even matter if your LDL cholesterol is low, you're still at risk for heart disease. And study after study after study showed that. So much so that the lipidology world started developing all drugs that raised HDL cholesterol. Because if low HDL cholesterol is bad, if we raise it, we'll cure you. And every one of those trials has failed using a drug that raises HDL cholesterol. There was no cardiovascular outcome benefit. So now that took 30 years to happen. So it's easy for me to say now we know uh, treating low HDL cholesterol doesn't matter. But here's what really why low HDL cholesterol might be a risk factor, might not be. All of those early studies that came out and said low HDL cholesterol is bad news were never adjusted for apolipoprotein B because they didn't even have ApoB studies in those days. So we now know if you have low HDL cholesterol, immediately return to the lab and demand an ApoB level. And you will see by far the most common cause of in, of Low HDL cholesterol is insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. If you have insulin resistance with a low HDL cholesterol, your ApoB is through the roof, and that's why you're going to get atherosclerotic heart disease with your insulin resistance. Statins, uh, ADA mandates statins on everybody who's a di diabetic above a certain age, and it's for that reason to get rid of the atherogenic ApoB-containing particles. So low HDL cholesterol is a poor man's guesstimate that you probably have a high ApoB. We do know now there are people with low HDL cholesterol who do not get atherosclerotic heart disease. And we know there are people with elevated heart uh, HDL cholesterol who do. So you can never make an individual decision based on HDL cholesterol. If you want to tell me, hey, that Norway's got higher HDL cholesterol in Zimbabwe, all right, there'll probably be less heart attacks in Norway than there would be in Zimbabwe. But that never translates to an individual patient where you have to zero in on the causal agent. So please, those of you who have low HDL cholesterol, measure ApoB. And if it's high, your therapeutic goal is not to raise HDL cholesterol. That doesn't work. It's to lower ApoB. Okay. The last metric, uh, and an important one if you can't get ApoB, is you mentioned non-HDL cholesterol. Well, what the hell is that? Well, obviously, listen to what it is. Non-HDL cholesterol is the cholesterol that's not in your HDL particles, right? <laughs> you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to understand that word. So if cholesterol is not in an HDL particle, what type of lipoprotein particles would the cholesterol be in? There's only one other class of particles, your ApoB particles. So non-HDL cholesterol is the poor man's lingo for ApoB cholesterol. And obviously, in general, ApoB cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, has a high correlation with ApoB. It's actually a higher correlation than does LDL cholesterol have to ApoB. So non -H if you can't get ApoB, you're going to look at your LDL cholesterol, but even if your LDL cholesterol is fine, but your non-HDL cholesterol is still abnormal, you almost certainly have a high ApoB and you need, your LDLC might be a goal. Now you have to get your non-HDLC to goal. What you really have to get to goal is your ApoB level. So here, the one problem I still have with that, where ApoB is so readily available and cheap is, yes, non-HDLC is better than LDLC is better than total cholesterol, but ApoB is better than any of them. There's nice studies published that shows there's even discordance between ApoB and non-HDL cholesterol, where the non-HDLC looks pretty good, but damn it, the ApoB is still high. That person needs more aggressive treatment. So those are your lipid measures. You do those, you throw in an LP little a, and you're off to a pretty good start on at least ascertaining lipid and lipoprotein mediated risk. The sort of take-home message there is if you want to get a really good idea as to how many of these ApoB-containing lipoproteins are crashing into your artery wall and potentially 
causing this um, cascade that leads to atherosclerosis. ApoB is going to be the best test, followed by non-HDL cholesterol, followed by LDL cholesterol, followed by total cholesterol. Yeah, but think of non-HDL cholesterol. I said, hey, it's the ApoB cholesterol, but how do we come up with that number? You take total cholesterol, the cholesterol that's in all of your particles, you subtract from it the HDL cholesterol, and you're left with the ApoB cholesterol. So it's a simple calculation that anybody uh, who's graduated grammar school can do, uh, and it's easy. Now, of course, somebody's going to have to teach you what are the normal levels, but uh, it, you want to look at that. If you get it done in a the lab, they probably have a little chart there that tells you what the risk ranges are. But... Uh, I think we all got to know them all. So I don't want you to go out and just do an ApoB and not look at the rest of the lipid panel. I think all of the information is useful. If you really were cash strapped, I'd say the really only two, once you get LP little a, and that's done with forever, the only test you really need is triglycerides and ApoB. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can basically say the big three then are ApoB, LP little a, you're going to do that once, and triglycerides. And if you have those three, you can really predict your risk of atherosclerosis. Yep, you've passed lipids 101 if you understand that. Mm -hmm. And I should have asked this earlier, but when while we're on cardiac imaging, you did mention CT angiogram, and the other one that often comes up is the carotid intima media thickness test, sort of ultrasound um, test. When when would it be indicated or, or when would you recommend a CT angiogram or a carotid intima media thickness test over a, a coronary artery calcium scan? So a CT angiogram is different. We actually look inside the lumen of the arteries. We inject dye. We time it correctly. We can actually see inside the lumen. We can tell, um, especially these newer higher resolution ones, we can actually even see soft plaque, which is nice. Um, but we can tell if there's like a 50% LED blockage, kind of like the, you know, in the, in the artery here. If your artery is plugged up 50%, like, like in this scenario here, we can actually see that and tell you exactly. And I read those. We can actually see that in, in the imaging and tell you, hey, look, you got have a 50%, maybe 60% LED, you might want to be on a statin or whatnot, take it easy and we'll, you know, eventually you will do a stress test or whatnot to, because, because a stress test is a functional test. These are not really functional. You need a functional test to tell if that, and I, maybe we're getting too sciencey, but a functional test will tell you if that uh, occlusion is enough to cause symptoms. So if we put you on a treadmill, and we have you jog, if you're starting to feel squeezing chest pain and your EKG changes, and, and when we perfuse you with the imaging, we see a difference between the uptake in that area, then we know that functionally that lesion is significant, even though it looked like only 60% on the CT scanner. Whereas um, if we do just a CT scan itself and you have no symptoms and no nothing, we really wouldn't do a functional test. We wouldn't order a stress test. Um, so I think that the different imaging modalities all help to um, come up with a picture. The nice thing about a CT angio is it's quick, 45 seconds, maybe a minute. We get a pretty good picture of your coronaries, the inside of the lumen, how they course. Do they like, you know, there's, there's, there's sometimes a case where you can have an anomalous coronary artery. If the uh, left, left main, for example, passes between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, when you exert yourself, they dilate and they crush the left main or LAD or RCA, whatever it is, you could go into cardiac arrest because you have no more blood flow, nutrients, oxygen going to that part of the myocardium, that part of the heart muscle, you could drop dead. Um, so the imaging does help in certain scenarios. Um, I forgot what the first part of your question was, but that's the CT angio uh, part of the equation. I guess I'm wondering for, for someone who hasn't seen a cardiologist before, let's say someone's just listening now, they have a relationship with their physician, they get blood tests done, they haven't had a reason to see a cardiologist. Is there any utility of these, these scans for the average person who's not at high risk of cardiovascular disease from a, a kind of screening um, point of view to sort of ascertain where their cardiovascular health is at? Or are they something that we really only use for someone once they have certain risk factors? 
So if you have no chest pain and no symptoms, you really shouldn't be getting any of these tests. You, if you do have symptoms, you get a stress test because it's a functional test. Now, if you're just curious and you want a CT, angio, and a CAC, they can actually do both together. They'll do the low dose CAC first and then inject you with the dye and do the CT angio. There, there's not any utility. I personally have never ordered them myself. There was one 19 year old that kept getting short of breath on a treadmill. We did a stress in any past and we did a whole bunch of other things in the past. So we just wanted to see if he had an anomalous coronary to see if his coronary passed between the aorta and pulmonary artery. Um, these are big vessels and I'll pop up a heart here. If, if your coronary artery like this, this uh, right here, for example, passes between the aorta and pulmonary artery and they swell during exercise, that could cause an occlusion that's big enough to cause a lack of blood flow to that part of the heart and trigger an arrhythmia or shortness of breath or whatever his symptoms were. That was the only scenario that I have actually uh, ordered in, but really there's no utility to these. They're good for research. People will go pay for them like these high paid, you know, executives will go and just pay for them and it's becoming cheaper. And most people can get one. I don't know that it adds anything to us that we didn't know based on your LDL. Like we know if your LDL is like over 130, you probably have placking. If it's way over 130, it's probably way worse. If you're under 100, under 80, you're probably going to be fine. Um, now, if you're curious and you just want to do these tests for fun or to satisfy your curiosity, that's okay. But I, I don't know that we that that we would use them in day to day clinical practice. They're great for research because they do give us some things. Oh, you said carotid in, um, intimal thickening as well. They use that in research to see if plaques regress. Like I know, for example, when they tested Crestor and Lipitor, the two most potent statins, you did see a slight regression of plaques in the carotid intima. The reason they use that is it's accessible. You can just put an ultrasound right up on somebody's neck and see it, whereas it's very difficult to do non-invasive you know, plaque imaging on coronaries. Now that we have slightly better imaging modalities like cardiac MRIs and things like that, maybe um, we can do that. But this was like a surrogate marker for placking in your, um, your heart. Because if you have carotid artery thickening or placking and you have it in your peripheral and you, you probably also have it in your coronaries. Um, so that was the logic there to test the efficacy of drugs to see if we can cause it to regress uh, or not. It's a it's an okay marker. Um, it Not everybody who has carotid problems has coronary, um, but still it's something useful for research where we want to know, it, it, let's say this is one millimeter today, we put you on Crestor, wait a year, check it, maybe it got to 0.98, you know, uh, the very minimal regression, but that's big in something that's that small. Um, so I don't know that it plays a role, you know, clinically. It's They're good for research, however. So for someone listening who is just curious, is is happy to, to cover the costs of the imaging, um, which, which of those three, it sounds like the CT angiogram is going to be the one that you would recommend. The CT angiogram would definitely give us the most clinical value and relevance because, because based off that, we could go straight to cardiac angiogram. If you have a LAD lesion that's 70% and you kind of have symptoms but you don't, we could justify doing a cardiac cath, I mean, and, and seeing if that's uh, something that needs to be stented or not. You mentioned regression, and that gets, gets me thinking. If someone uh, has a scan done, there is a significant amount of, of soft plaque, um, and they change their lifestyle, they jump on some medications, whether it's a statin or a statin plus azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, um, the, the amount of that plaque can reduce. I think people are really interested to understand this. Can they reverse some of that damage? And is, is, it, is that reversal, that regression, what causes the reduction in events? So that's a really good question because everybody on here says, how do I reverse plaques? How do I reverse placking? How do I make it regress? How do I do this? The the studies, once you have plaque, you have plaque. It's all, it's very difficult. There's almost no way to make it go away completely. If you have like a 20% lesion with Crestor and Lipitor, and if you do everything right, start eating better, all the things we've talked about, you know, lifestyle wise, you can stabilize it. 
generally most people will be able to stabilize it and in some cases make it regress a little because it like when it calcifies it kind of just like kind of tightens up and pulls in a little there's no way to make it go away completely if if that's what they're asking and, and people ask this question a lot, well what can i do to reverse heart disease or what can i do to reverse you know placking in my arteries there's not a lot you can do to reverse it but you can stop it you can halt it you can make it so it doesn't progress you can make it so it doesn't get worse you know statins do that exercise can do that eating different you know diet like the things we've talked about can do that reducing saturated fat can make a a really big difference you know those kind of things matter but to make it go away completely is not generally uh, a possibility yes well i think we should touch on hdl here a little bit and oh, and perhaps Perhaps firstly, I'm not sure that we've we've kind of stated this in this series so far, but um, I'm certainly guilty of this in years gone by using this terminology of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And I, I hope, um, you know, I'll put my hand up. Um, I, I hope that now with greater appreciation that everyone would have for the lipid transport system that we understand that the cholesterol in a HDL is no different to the cholesterol in an LDL. What differentiates them is is the protein that is uh, encasing these uh, lipoproteins. So the kind of idea of good and bad cholesterol sort of doesn't make sense when you get your head around the physiology. Um, but that aside, people may still kind of associate or see HDL as the good part of the lipid system. And they might be wondering, Tom, can we take a drug that increases HDL particle number to lower our risk of this disease? Unfortunately not. We know that because we had a drug that increased HDL particle number and HDL cholesterol, and those were fibric acids. And in clinical trials, uh, they, they did not work. We had niacin, which drastically increased HDL cholesterol, did very little to HDL particle count, but it raised HDL cholesterol even higher than fibrates mm -hmm. do, and it failed in three major CVOT, cardiovascular outcome trials. So we have those two examples, and we have the first three CETP inhibitors, which drastically, they raise HDL cholesterol by 100%. The first one failed because it had toxic side effects. The next one failed because although it raised HDL cholesterol, it did zero to ApoB, so it didn't work. The third one came along that seriously raised HDL cholesterol, uh, but actually lowered ApoB a little bit, but the company didn't see a signal of benefit, so they abandoned the trial. Many think if they let that go longer, it would have worked. The fourth CETP inhibitor, which lowered ApoB a little bit, actually succeeded in reducing events. It also raised HDL cholesterol 100%, but the little bit of benefit that came was attributed to the lowering of ApoB. The final, the fifth one that they're checking now is a drastic ApoB lowerer. So, uh, the hope is, and like all the other ones, it's going to raise HDL cholesterol in the stratosphere, but they believe it's going to be successful because it lowers ApoB sort of in the statin range. It's also going to be co-prescribed with azetamibe almost certainly too to get other benefits. All of the CTP inhibitors also reduce LP little a for whatever that's worth by inhibiting the synthesis of APO little a. So it's like PCSK9. So maybe that's going to be a benefit of it too. But uh, we have no proof that raising HDL cholesterol is good. And it's simple because in the old days, you were taught low HDL cholesterol is a terrible risk factor. You're going to die. And if you have high HDL cholesterol, you're protected. Hence, good cholesterol in the HDL, but you better have a lot of it. We now, those trials sunk that theory because the drugs that raise HDL did not afford cardio protection. All right. So what is the most common cause of low HDL cholesterol? I actually did, you won't believe it, a two-hour webinar this afternoon to a group of physicians totally dedicated to HDLs. So I know a lot of, I've written tons of stuff on HDLs and lectured on it extensively. So anyway, HDL particles don't have ApoB. They're a separate family of lipoproteins and their structural particle is ApoProtein uh, A1. And they have a couple of copies of ApoA1 per HDL particle. The only lipid that's on the inside of an HDL particle is cholesterol. 
there should be zero to minuscule triglycerides in an HDL particle. And that's so if cholesterol is the only thing they carry, HDL cholesterol is the cholesterol carried in all your HDLs. So what is the most common cause of why HDL cholesterol goes down? Who do we see that in? Diabetics and people with high triglycerides. So when your trigs goes up, trigs are transferred out of the ApoB particles, the VLDLs and LDLs, into the HDLs. And the HDLs say, to make room for the trigs, you guys take my cholesterol. So the HDL loses its cholesterol and acquires triglyceride. If you take cholesterol out of HDL particles, your HDL cholesterol is going to go down. But where is that cholesterol now going into an ApoB particle? Yeah, that might frighten you because ApoBs can go into the artery wall and dump it. HDLs cannot. All right. Now, hard to believe. We all know how many ApoB, VLDLs, and LDL particles we have. We also know how many HDL particles a person has. Whatever number of ApoB particles you have, and 90% of them are LDLs, you have 28 times more HDL particles than you have LDL particles. So it's a super duper massive, it is the king of lipoproteins floating in your bloodstream here now. But HDL cholesterol is usually lower than LDL cholesterol. How can that be? If you have 28 times more HDLs, how could they be carrying less cholesterol than your LDLs? Remember, the volume of a spear is the third power of the radius. So as particles get bigger, they can carry humongous numbers of lipid molecules. The average size HDL particle carries 45 molecules of cholesterol. The average LDL particle carries 2,500 molecules of cholesterol. So even though you have 28 times more HDLs, they carry so little cholesterol, it rarely exceeds LDL cholesterol. So that's why. But the reason HDL cholesterol will go down when trigs invade it, cholesterol goes out, you have triglyceride-rich HDLs, HDL cholesterol falls, and what is the most common colipid disturbance in people with low HDL cholesterol? It's high triglycerides, it's diabetics, it's insulin-resistant people, or people with genetic causes of hypertriglyceridemia. They have very low HDL cholesterol because their HDLs are not carrying cholesterol anymore. They're carrying triglycerides. When you have a triglyceride-rich HDL, it's subject to rapid lipolysis. The triglycerides get hydrolyzed, they're removed. Now you have an inchy weensy HDL, which sort of explodes. ApoA1 breaks off, goes into the kidney where it gets catabolized and you pee away the amino acids. So triglycerides causes HDLs to carry less cholesterol molecules and it increases their rapid catabolism. So what does virtually everybody with high triglycerides and cardiovascular risk have? High ApoB. So when you see low HDL cholesterol on your lipid panel, make sure if it's not done, the next day you go and get an ApoB test because the overwhelming vast majority of people you will see in clinical practice with low HDL cholesterol who are not already on a drug will have high ApoB. Ergo, the goal of therapy when you treat ApoB is to get ApoB to goal. And if you're not measuring ApoB, when HDL cholesterol is low, you get both LDLC and non-HDLC to goal. So that's what you really have to know about HDL cholesterol. I could give you all the nuances on what HDL does with its cholesterol, and maybe I'll spend a minute on that. But the worrisome bit about low HDL cholesterol is it's a warning to you, get your damn ApoB checked. And if it's high, do whatever you got to do, lifestyle or drugs, to get ApoB down. If you're a diabetic, you need to be on a statin day one. How much of the sort of cardiometabolic disease burden that we see today do you feel is is explained by sedentary lifestyles and a lack of, of specific cardiovascular training versus other things like nutrition, which you just mentioned. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to wear my, 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 uh, uh, cell physiology background, right. And, and try to see this from, from a, a decrease in mitochondrial function or a decay in the mitochondrial function. So, um, 
uh, the mitochondria, you know, is, as we know, the powerhouses of the cells. And this is how we have been uh, learning about that for, for decades, right? However, not until, until recently, relatively, relatively speaking, we've been very interested in mitochondrial function. And now um, what we see is like pretty much no matter which medical field you get into and you talk to leading researchers uh, in, 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 in multiple medical fields, everybody's stumbling upon mitochondria, right? And mitochondrial function. Now, when it comes to cardiometabolic disease, um, uh, there are two main events that happen um, when it comes to nutrition. One is the metabolization uh, of uh, um, carbohydrates and, the, uh, and, and fats. So um, um, during postprandial conditions after a meal, um, about 80% of all carbohydrates are burned or metabolized in, in skeletal muscle, right? Uh, and, and it's time to really call skeletal muscle an organ. It's probably the largest organ in the body. And uh, it's very important to, to, to see this because uh, within skeletal muscle um, at rest, carbohydrates, which are turned into glucose in the blood, no matter what type of carbohydrate you have, whether it's good or bad carbohydrates, they're all going to become glucose in the blood. Like fructose, uh, most of the fructose that you ingest is converted uh, uh, by the liver into glucose, right? So all that has to be metabolized and under resting conditions, about 80% are done in, in, in skeletal muscle. And within skeletal muscle, this happens in mitochondria. So if you have a, a, a dysfunctional mitochondria or or a mitochondrial that is uh, impaired, you're going to have a metabolic challenge because you're going to have to burn uh, the, that glucose. And if you don't do it correctly, uh, eventually uh, you're going to have a problem because that glucose is going to be building up in the blood, causing um, hyperglycemia, high blood glucose levels. And uh, the pancreas reacts to that because it's dangerous to have high glucose levels. And the pancreas reacts by releasing uh, insulin. And insulin triggers the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the transportation of glucose inside the cell. But it's not just about the transport of glucose inside the cell, which is what we've been hearing for decades, right? Uh, the, the world of type 2 diabetes has been evolved um, more at peripheral level, if you will, at the level of hyperglycemia, insulinemia or hyperinsulinemia, um, um, insulin resistance, even GLUT4, which are the, the, the transporters of glucose, uh, they are stimulated by, by insulin, right? But we need to start talking about pyruvate and about the fate of, inglu of, of, of glucose inside the cell, because this is absolutely key. Because one thing is to transport glucose inside the cell, and the other thing is to metabolize glucose to ATP and energy in mitochondria of in, inside the cell, right? So this is the key, the, key, the key aspect. So there's two sort of critical things here we're talking about with regards to glucose and metabolic health. One is the ability to get glucose from circulation into the muscle cell. And you sort of alluded to the fact that that's been the story for a long time. And earlier you spoke about intramuscular fat. And so to my understanding, part of that story has been that as fat starts to accumulate in muscle tissue, it can make it harder to get glucose into the cell. Yeah. But what you're adding and, and saying is that the story of metabolic health and glucose metabolism and the difference between someone with poor metabolic health and an elite athlete goes beyond that. And we need to begin thinking about once that glucose is within the cell, how it is being metabolized, which I believe from, from, from your work and, and it's something that we're going to discuss comes down to the function and health of the mitochondria. Exactly. And, 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 and then the problem is like, if you don't metabolize that glucose in mitochondria, inside the cell within mitochondria, then uh, you have a metabolic challenge, right? And eventually, yeah, you're going to increase uh, or you're going to elicit a condition of uh, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, eventually insulin resistance. But the same thing, and the same thing happens also, or the, the same metabolic uh, problem happens with fats because uh, fats can only be oxidized in mitochondria as well, 
right? So when uh, fats cannot be oxidized in mitochondria, they, they, they build up, right? You cannot utilize them as uh, energy. So you store them, you store them in adipose tissue, but you also store them just into mitochondria in, um, um, in, in the muscle, right? And that eventually increases the reservoir or, or the deposits of, of, of fat inside muscle, right? Which is, again, as I said at the beginning, right? It's, it's highly related to insulin resistance, right? And, and that could be a connection between cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, we know that about 80% of, not 80%, I don't want to say a percentage yet because we still have to learn more, but a big, a big number of people with type 2 diabetes, they also have a cardiovascular disease and vice versa. And this is what's been now termed more like a cardiometabolic disease, right? Because it's the combination of both diseases, right? So, so this is what uh, probably a big nexus for this is, uh, uh, it happens in, in mitochondria. Let's dive straight into the deep end here. And then maybe if need be along the way, I can ask you to clarify a few things. What is the twin cycle hypothesis? The twin cycle hypothesis was my attempt to put together all the observations on how the body actually worked, how the body dealt with food and metabolism and what went wrong in type 2 diabetes? So, over the years, we'd learned, firstly, that muscle was very resistant to insulin, and using MRI techniques, advanced MRI techniques, we could measure the glycogen in muscle, and, in fact, use this to show that people who had normal uh, insulin sensitivity in muscle stored a lot of their food as muscle glycogen within the first five hours after eating. One third, really quite a lot. Whereas people who had low sensitivity to insulin in muscle, so-called insulin resistance, those people stored almost none. And from other work, we knew that the only way that that glucose would be handled is not being stored properly. The only way it could be handled would be for the body to turn it into fat. Now that sounds like magic, but that's exactly what the liver does. And so that excess glucose would be shunted into fat and people would be more likely to build up fat in the liver. Now we'd shown fat in the liver causes the liver not to respond to insulin. Now, I put all this together, and the twin cycle hypothesis runs like this. Basically, a little too much food over a long period of time will cause fat to start building up in the liver. And when the liver starts getting resistant to insulin, it will start putting out too much glucose, because insulin usually dampens down the constant production of the liver of glucose. So there we have glucose rising a bit, but what happens next is that the pancreas kicks in and insulin levels rise a bit to just bring things under control. Now that's fine temporarily, but unfortunately insulin speeds up the process of turning glucose into fat. And so we've got a vicious cycle that started running. That will run on and glucose levels will gradually peg up. But it's not just the glucose that the liver puts out. The liver also puts out fat for the rest of the body. The liver really supplies you with the energy you need to live every day. Overnight, it's the glucose coming out from the body that keeps your brain alive, and the fat coming out from your liver that keeps the rest of the body alive. That's what they use to burn for energy, second by second. It's an astonishing process. But if there's too much fat in the liver, then that one liver cycle will have a knock-on effect because it will leave too much fat in the blood. The liver puts out too much fat. It will be delivered to all tissues. Now, any excess fat would usually be stored under the skin. And metabolically, that's safe. It doesn't cause any metabolic damage. 
However, in the situation of excess and with a relatively full subcutaneous under the skin compartment, then fat's going to build up elsewhere. And that's the problem. And it's when fat starts building up inside the pancreas that really the action starts. So we have a second vicious cycle in the pancreas. The fat stops the insulin-producing cells from working properly. Lo and behold, that means glucose levels are higher after every meal. And lo and behold, that means more glucose is going to be turned into fat. And so we have these twin vicious cycles interacting. The importance of this twin cycle, Simon, was that it explained type 2 diabetes as a simple chain of events. Yes, interacting cycles, but a single cause. Now, that is simple. And what we see in populations is when they're overfed, diabetes erupts. If they're relatively starved, diabetes goes away. So all of a sudden, we had a handle on this, and it was a complete revelation and a move away from what all the experts were saying up to 2011, that type 2 diabetes was a complex heterogeneous disorder caused by multiple different factors. Well, that's nonsense. Basically, you inherit your genes, but if you put on a bit too much weight, heavier than you can bear, then these twin vicious cycles will start turning. And being a hypothesis, it could be tested and shown to be right or wrong. You said there that the twin cycle hypothesis provides an explanation for a single cause. What if someone is thinking, well, hang on, how can excessive calories explain this if not everyone who becomes overweight or obese ends up with type 2 diabetes? That's a very good question. The first point to make is that there's a wide range of thresholds at which people will develop type 2 diabetes. So in our most recent study, we've demonstrated that those slim people who get type 2 diabetes have got too much fat inside their organs. They simply don't show the fat. So there's this matter of how much fat and this personal threshold for fat. But there's a further point which is really important. About 70% of people of white European ethnicity will not, never get diabetes, no matter how much they eat, how fat they become. And in fact, at the moment, 73% of people with, uh, who have a body mass in, in, sorry, a body mass index over 40 do not have type 2 diabetes and show no signs of getting it in the near future. So we can see that it's only a proportion of people who are susceptible. And that is the stop-go of getting type 2 diabetes. So there are really two stages. One is the eating too much the other is the uh, genetic factor. But why do I say that it's just one? Well, it's because I'm talking to a group of individuals. They are one person each. And in my consultations with patients, I only have one person in front of me. And that person comes in with a ready-made collection of genes. They are themselves. Now, doctors have to practice the art of the possible. So I'm dealing with individuals. If a person presents to me with type 2 diabetes, they have insulin-producing cells that are susceptible to fat. And that is, the, that is the whole point. So this disease is simple to understand. Right, so it's, it's not necessarily fat or being overweight or obesity that is the single explanation but it is fat getting inside these organs the liver and the pancreas specifically fat i guess where we could say it shouldn't be in individuals that are more susceptible to this so certain individuals as they're gaining weight are more genetically predisposed to having fat 
stored within organs, whereas other individuals have a greater capacity, would that be the right terminology to store more fat subcutaneously and not inside these organs? Yes, that's absolutely right. Okay, so let me throw back to you what I grasped from your explanation of the twin cycle hypothesis. So it all kind of begins with this positive calorie balance. So a very small calorie surplus over a long period of time, coupled with muscle insulin resistance. This results in an increase in blood glucose or that extra glucose, the body has to do something with it. Instead of forming glycogen in muscle tissue, you get an increase in de novo lipogenesis, which is the conversion of glucose to fat within the liver. With the increase in liver fat, you get insulin resistance in the liver. Insulin's job at the liver being to slow down or halt the uh, flux of glucose from the liver into circulation. So with that, you get an increase in blood glucose. The, the response from the pancreas there is to increase insulin. So insulin levels go up and insulin then increases or drives more fat production in the liver. Eventually, the body has to do something with that excess fat being produced in the liver, packages it up in um, lipoproteins, these VLDL, uh, very low density lipoproteins, which are an APOB containing lipoprotein and are therefore atherogenic, and they go out into circulation. If the subcutaneous fat storage has been exceeded, that excess fat that is now in circulation, it has to go somewhere. And eventually it can begin to build up in organs, particularly the pancreas, which then can begin to affect the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin such that there is reduced insulin in response to ingesting a carbohydrate containing meal. And with that, you get increase in plasma glucose and the, the liver begins to convert more glucose into fat and so forth. The cycle kind of self perpetuates. Did I grasp all of that correctly? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So my understanding, at least when it comes to type 2 diabetes, is that about five out of six people with type 2 diabetes are in the kind of overweight or obese BMI classification, and then one out of six are considered normal, which was what Roy Taylor was looking at in um, that study. And I think part of the rationale, if I remember reading correctly, was that there had been some debate around, well, maybe people who are getting type 2 diabetes who are a quote-unquote normal BMI, maybe the etiology, the cause of type 2 diabetes for those people is different, something else causing it, and therefore maybe the in intervention is is different. When I try and sort of reconcile all of this, and, and again, I appreciate we're talking about type 2 diabetes here, so we can then think about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease separately, even though they're very related. It's that shared commonality across all of these people that are developing type 2 diabetes anyway, regardless of what their BMI is, is the accumulation of too much fat inside or organs, between organs, fat where it shouldn't be. And for, for various reasons, that's occurring in some people who are what we would describe as a normal BMI. It's not the majority of people. And then for everyone else, it's occurring at you know, higher BMIs, but common amongst all of them. And what seems to be driving the metabolic consequences is this fat that is finding its way into the wrong tissues. And Roy Taylor's most recent study kind of highlights that there's also a shared intervention that if you can adopt a hypocaloric diet, hypocaloric meaning less calories than your body sort of requires to maintain its weight. And you can do that 
in a way where you are able to reduce your total body weight by enough such that you get the fat out of the wrong places, then you can begin to kind of unwind some of this, this metabolic, these metabolic derangements that are occurring. And in many people, if you, if they haven't had that condition for too long, go into uh, what's described as, as remission. Do you think that that is, is similar for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in that I mean, the majority of people that develop this are probably overweight or obese, but there there could be a kind of lean phenotype or a, a, a person who have normal BMI that gets non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and without having the study, I, I'm not. I don't believe there's been a study looking specifically at this with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but. Do you think it's it's the same scenario where um, regardless of that person's BMI, if they adopt a hypochloric diet and lose enough body weight, they can get the fat out of the liver and reverse the, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, to the point where all of those biomarkers and, and um, diagnostics sort of return to, to normal levels? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, I think what you're describing is is an overarching um, commonality uh, that that may encapsulate the the drivers of of metabolic disease overall, and so it's almost at a level of principle that that description is accurate, and obviously, then the kind of specifics may differ, uh, you know, relative to what exactly we're talking about um between say for example fatty liver versus type 2 but as an overarching unifying principle that we have the excess accumulation uh of fat in the liver driving hepatic insulin resistance um contributing to an increased concentration of circulating free fatty acids particularly in the in the postprandial period or in the period after a meal therefore influencing new triglycerides synthesis um impairing the clearance of of triglycerides in the postprandial period or post meal period and so you, you know you, you mentioned that that Guy and I used the term you know energy toxicity well, we have this term lipotoxicity which is really characterizing all of that as 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 an umbrella term for all of those factors that I was just describing, this increase in flow of fats to other tissues, which then drives, you know, the uh, increased inflammatory profile of adipose tissue, if we're talking about these visceral uh, depots, liver depots, immune responses, oxidative stress. And so th this is the, th this is potentially present in individuals at different levels of BMI. And would imply that the intervention, and we know from the, the body of available intervention evidence on hypocaloric diets, like, like we alluded to earlier, that macronutrient composition is secondary to the restriction of, of energy intake will allow for, for that clearance. And we do know that there is, uh, you know, individuals can be characterized by fatty liver in the absence of. Uh, a BMI in the obese categories range. So, to your point, does does the similar proposition offered by by the Retune study uh, apply in the context of fatty liver? Overall, we would we would say, I think, from the body of evidence, that it does. So, how much overlap is there between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and type two diabetes? And is it possible? that someone is diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but they, they don't have type two diabetes because their, their pancreas is, you know, able to sort of compensate and just produce more insulin. And they're able to kind of keep their blood glucose within the normal range, despite the excess fat that has been accumulating in the liver and the insulin resistance there. Yes. So it is possible that an individual have fatty liver without necessarily a diagnosis of type 2. So they conditions can exist 
independently. But in terms of, I guess, the modern, because of course, you know, type 2 diabetes can itself be be influenced strongly by, by genetic risk factors, can occur at kind of normal weight BMIs, et cetera. Both can exist independently, but in the context of, you know, what we're dealing with in a in, in, in the population now with the 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 abundance of of excess energy, et cetera, the correlation between the two is particularly strong and they and they may coexist. And the co the coexistence of fatty liver and type 2 diabetes is associated with, you know, an overall worse risk profile, metabolic profile than simply having uh, either uh, alone. In terms of overall prevalence uh, of, of the correlation, of the coexistence of the two conditions, uh, there was a meta-analysis in 2017 that suggested, on average, the pooled prevalence was, was just about 60% uh, in terms of the association between fatty liver and type 2 diabetes incidence. But the actual individual study estimates ranged uh, and, and, and were in some studies, I think the highest uh, prevalence of, of, of the coexistence was, was 87% um, in one study. So, but, but the, again, the average prevalence in the, in the analysis was, was about 60%. Um, and it, it, if we're talking about the overall uh you know, we've been discussing a lot the kind of under the hood kind of mechanistic stuff here. It's it's unsurprising. Um, we know, obviously, we we we've touched on this, but to to kind of circle back to, I guess, re-emphasize and cement it in listeners' heads. You know, if the liver becomes fatty, the liver becomes insulin resistance. That that resistance to insulin, um, then impairs the suppression of liver glucose production that would occur in an otherwise healthy individual that's just consumed a meal. So you get increased fasting, fasting glucose levels, you get elevated insulin levels. Um, you've got obviously the exacerbation of, of overall insulin resistance and even skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity from continually elevated circulating fatty acids and indeed the accumulation of intramyocellular so the accumulation of fat and muscle cells um all influencing you know the, the overall kind of state of insulin resistance and then of course there is this lipotoxicity we mentioned briefly just there where this excess accumulation of fat in the liver and in visceral organs starts to to spill over um, and this can include the pancreas, and the pancreas itself can start to increase its fat depots. Uh, and the consequence of this increase of 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 fat in the in the you know in the in the cells of the pancreas is to you know impair the you know signaling pathways ex associated with the the uh, uh, with with insulin function. Um, you know the defective um ability for insulin to and, and the beta cells to produce and um release insulin and so you get this progressive decline in the in the capacity of the beta cells to function and that's the primary hallmark characteristic that predates a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes so you've got elevated glucose factors or hyperglycemic factors you've got elevated insulin um factors and, and elevated insulin resistance in the liver all complicated by by fatty liver you've got this relationship with circulating lipids non-esterified or free fatty acids and elevated triglycerides all kind of interacting where the presence of, of fatty liver can drive the progression of of type 2 diabetes um and you know there there are there are kind of little little available pharmaceutical interventions that are specific to fatty liver um 
some diabetic drugs can have kind of it seems effects but 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 really the capacity to exert um a kind of reversal of the levels of fat in the liver to to normal ranges is is very much you know something that 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 can be influenced by a diet of course energy balance within that and um you know specific nutrients then secondary to energy balance and uh physical activity as well let's say someone's listening right now who's been diagnosed with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes and they're listening and they're thinking i'm going to give this a go i'm going to adopt this way of eating that dr Furman's talking about and lose some weight what you're saying is there's a chance if they lose enough weight that and if they have enough um, beta cell function remaining that they could significantly reduce their medications or come off them? More than 90%, easily 90%, maybe more than that, can come off them with type 2 diabetes, can get off the medication and become non-diabetic. And it's not only having beta cell reserve left, it's also reclaiming some non-functioning beta cells that are hibernating due to inflammation. And lack. Of, so we see that um, we have, not only do we see the body's insulin needs be less, but we also see a recovery of the of the pancreas to produce some more insulin. So yes, I see type two diabetes routinely get better, but of course there are gonna be some type one and a halfs and people whose pancreas are so burned out that they still would require some medication or some insulin. Um, but that's not common. That's, you know, that's very uncommon. How does someone determine what their ideal body weight is? I think, you know, we usually measure measure their body fat percent as a good, getting a good indicator and seeing, well, you know, if they put their body fat in a favorable range, like, um, you know, what's, you know, it's not that hard. And also when they eat healthfully and lose weight, if they keep eating healthfully, their body keeps losing to, a, and it stops losing when it reaches their ideal weight, usually at a more closer to their set point at a weight that's usually thinner than they, than they might think they would have been able to reach to. You know, so generally I'm saying people should be thinner than they, what they think is right. When people come in to see me, they think, oh, I'm 50 pounds overweight. And I'm thinking, you're not, you're 60 pounds overweight. I'm 80 pounds overweight, you're not, you're really 100 pounds overweight. Because what they're thinking they need to lose, they need to lose more. Because I have these ultimate expectations. I'm going for, my might as well shoot for perfection and get their body fat below 25% if they're a female and below 15% of a male, which is not perfection. I'm almost 70 years old and my body fat percent is 11%. So, why, so 15% is still a compromise. Why should they have more than 50% body fat? How do we reduce our appetite? Because what can often happen and what you see in the literature here is someone loses a lot of weight. Their total daily energy expenditure goes down and they may have the same appetite or even more drive. It's like biology is kind of conspiring against the weight loss in this circumstance from a survival point of view. So this is where satiety seems to be really important. What are the things that someone can think about or draw on when they're making their meals or at the grocery store in terms of how do you, how do you get more satiety, increase satiety per calorie? Right. Well, that's kind of like what my job is and what my specialty is. Now you're in my wheelhouse, you know what I mean? This is what we do. We have people, how can, just to answer that question is, how do I be satisfied with the right amount of calories? And how do I eat instinctually so the amount of calories and food I desire is the right amount? Why should, you, why should there be a, a, you know, a disconnect between the amount, what you feel like eating and what's best for your body? It should be the same. So we want people to instinctually prefer the right amount of calories. But don't forget, that doesn't happen overnight. That takes time and training. You didn't become a, fan, a great athlete overnight either. You had to train with the right methods and technique for many years. So with training and with time, so we give people the right training, but they have to continue with repeating and practicing that over and over again. And eventually it happens where you're satisfied with the right amount of food. And then we're giving people both an adequate food volume and a lengthy and lengthening the process of digestion with slow digestible foods. So they're not feeling wasted and empty in the middle of the afternoon, let's say. What kind of foods are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about um, mixing four types of foods. And those four, let's, in, let's my, my typical lunch, 
I might have a salad and a bowl of vegetable bean soup and a piece of fruit for dessert, which is a light meal, but I made sure the salad had some nuts and seeds in it and the soup had some beans in it. So I had the beans and the nuts and the vegetables in the same meal and some fruit for dessert. Or at dinner time, I may have some quinoa, I may have green vegetables, I may have a little bit of bean or a little bit of, um, but I also had some little bit of nuts and seeds and a little bit of bean and a little bit of grain and a little bit of, so I, and I had some raw food for dinner too. And I also had dessert. I also had my frozen cherries, my whipped, my baked apple with the vanilla ice cream on top. I had my um, coconut macaroon or something. I had some dessert and dessert's an important part of this to, to, constrict, to constrict appetite because I'm gonna eat the dessert before I'm full. And I could still want more food, but I felt I had enough of a plate of food. And now by having the dessert before I'm full, it marks the end of eating for the day. I have something that's really satisfying and tastes you know, really delicious. And now I can shut down the restaurant, which means the kitchen, clean the kitchen, put the food away, clean my teeth, and be occupied with other non-food activities that are fun the rest of the night and stay away from food. Last night was a perfect example for me because I'm trying to do what I advise my patients and clients to do. Do you find it hard at times? At times it did. Like last night I went to, we went dancing, my wife and I out, after we ate dinner. Now I didn't want to eat much dinner because I knew I was going to go to this dance class, right? Actually we did the Argentino tango last night, okay? So we came home and I said, you know, I really didn't eat that much at dinner because I ran out to go to this dance class and I really feel like eating, but I know it's best for my, and I'm a little hungry. But I just had a glass of water. I watched the end of the basketball game, and I went to bed. I started to watch the movie, but I fell asleep and went to bed. I woke up in the morning, this morning to before I came here, and I was hungry. So I picked a, a, a pretty hefty breakfast. But the point was, I could have eaten at nighttime before I went to bed and think I'm hungry. I might as well eat. But I knew the hunger is so light was such a light that when you really have a, when you're in touch with true hunger, it doesn't make you uncomfortable. It doesn't make you interfere with sleep. And you know it's best to sleep on an empty stomach and not to have food in your belly when you're trying to sleep at night because that's lifespan enhancing. So I purposely didn't eat at last night, even though I might've come back from dinner, from dancing a little hungry. So you try so, and have a couple of hours before bed where you're not having food, ideally? I try to have four hours before bed with no food. I try to go to bed, finish eating by six o'clock and go to bed around 10 o'clock. So I want to have, I don't want to feel like my stomach is still digesting when I'm lying in bed trying to sleep at night. Because when you're sleeping at night, that's where you have enhanced healing, detoxification, removing of free radicals, repairing of the, and more weight loss occurs, by the way. But of course, we're talking that the anti-aging and longevity promoting phenomenon of the body is enhanced during sleep and is enhanced further when you're sleeping without digesting. So you usually have about 12 hours each day where you're not having food from correct. that dinner until, the, until your first food in the morning. That's correct. More than 12 hours. Let's see, if I stopped eating at 6, and I certainly don't eat before 7 or 8 in the morning. So maybe so, 14 so hours. So maybe 14 hours, yeah. Mm. Going back to this idea of where you're sort of storing fat mattering and you, you spoke about there's this different threshold and really the problems arise when you get excess energy in the blood, you get excess energy being deposited into organs like the pancreas and the liver and muscle tissue and then there's downstream metabolic, cardiometabolic consequences of this. If someone's kind of thinking, wow, I wonder you know, where my personal fat threshold is, is is waist circumference a kind of good way of, of gauging um, where you're storing body fat? Is that why waist circumference is used within the kind of metabolic um, syndrome cluster instead of BMI? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I don't have a quantitative answer for you and probably Roy Taylor is a better person to ask this question. But yeah, I mean, it is part of the metabolic syndrome cluster and it does correlate with insulin resistance. So I would say you know, having high abdominal adiposity, which is reflected in waist circumference is, yeah, that should correlate with um, being above or near your personal fat threshold. You know, I wanted to mention one other thing. I'm sorry to kind of barge in here, but there's one other thing that I think the audience really should understand. And that is that there, you know, the evidence that energy overload and excess body fat, excess energy intake are the, are the main drivers of type 2 diabetes is incredibly strong. 
I just want to emphasize just how strong it is. We have massive randomized controlled trials, multi-year trials with actual type 2 diabetes as the outcome, not surrogate measures, actual type 2 diabetes diagnoses, such as the Diabetes Prevention Program trial that showed a 58% reduction in transition from pre-diabetes to diabetes and uh, through a diet and exercise weight loss approach. And it was a you know pretty like old school calorie restriction, low fat diet. It wasn't that modern in terms of the intervention that they it was in it was modern in terms of the intensity of it and the uh the amount of interaction that there was with with the the researchers but um not the diet itself was pretty old school and you know there are other trials multiple other large multi-year trials like this that have replicated that finding there's also you know Roy Roy Taylor's work has shown that you can take people who already have type 2 diabetes and have had it sometimes for years. And you can reverse that diabetes if you can get them to lose enough weight. And so he puts them on these really low calorie, temporary low calorie diets for I think like a three month period. And then once they've lost weight, they try to keep them on a maintenance diet. Um, And then they can show that even after they're off this super low calorie diet at the 12 month mark, uh, a large proportion of these people, like over half, I think, if I'm recalling correctly, in the direct trial, uh, actually no longer met diagnostic criteria for type 2 diabetes. So the evidence for this is incredibly strong. I mean, in terms of diet and lifestyle causation, prevention, reversal of a non-communicable disease, I'm I'm not sure that there's any other disease that we have stronger evidence for than type two diabetes. What are the the kind of long term success rates? I guess I'm, when I say long term, and we may not even have that data, but I'm thinking out, you know, four, five, ten years. So following kind of extreme interventions like that that seem to have very high success rates, how able are people to keep that weight off and um and stay in a sort of state of remission. Yeah, it declines sharply. And I don't know if you saw it, but just recently there was a, I think it was a five-year follow-up from the direct trial. And caveat here is I haven't read the paper yet. I don't know what kind of maintenance intervention, if any, they had after the initial 12-month period. So I don't know whether people continued, you know, intensive weight maintenance efforts or whether they just kind of went back to their normal lives. However, I think if I'm recalling correctly, the top line figure was that about a quarter of the people who initially went into remission at 12 months uh, were still in remission. And so, you know, that's a pretty sharp decline over time in, in the number of people who stayed in remission. And what you see is that most of them regained a lot of the weight. And so this is typical, you know, this could be an entry point into talking about the difficulty of losing weight and and keeping it off because, you know, the direct trial did a pretty good job actually of causing people to lose weight and maintain that loss. Uh, I don't know, maybe people were more motivated because they were seeing these incredible results. But, um, you know, in typical weight loss trials, people will lose, if you if you follow up at, what you'll see is a, a weight loss curve. So max weight loss is usually around six months. And then they start typically to regain on average around that point. And by a year, if you weigh those people, and that this, you know, applies to almost any weight loss diet, I shouldn't say almost any, applies to the more effective weight loss diets that have been repeatedly studied, I should say. What you find is that at 12 months, usually people have regained 50, 70% of the weight that they had initially lost. And then you follow them out for five or 10 years. A few studies have done that, including the diabetes prevention program trial. You're going to see a gradual convergence between 
the weight of the intervention groups and the weight of the control groups that did not do a significant weight loss intervention. Let's, let's imagine a hypothetical scenario here. Um, a patient's in front of you, and I'm sure this has happened many times. You've, you've both experienced this, but um, patient's in front of you, they, they have a cancer diagnosis and they're sort of talking to you about all the different treatment options that are available. And they say to you, Doc, you know, how powerful is nutrition? And what I'm getting at here is the kind of magnitude of effect, if you have a sense for, for the magnitude of effect that, that nutrition may have on cancer development and helping to to treat cancer relative to other interventions that are available, pharmacotherapy, exercise, et cetera. And I ask this question because I think, you know, sometimes I watch the conversations on social media and I think in some, sometimes I think particularly dietitians and nutritionists, um, we can get ahead of ourselves a little bit. And, and if I look at the conversation around mental health, I think right now there's, you know, lots of claims made being made online about nutrition and mental health and in many ways minimizing other interventions. But there's not actually a whole lot of good outcome data on diet and and mental health. Um, so I'm curious as to kind of how you how you see the the magnitude of effect of nutrition you might not be able to answer this now but do you have some sort of of sense where this fits within all of the available interventions to someone how important it is yeah it's a great it's a great question because we do get asked that all the time um and i i think that you know my my approach to this is that it really the answer depends on, of course, the type of cancer uh, and, and, and where that person might be uh, in their cancer journey, if you will. Uh, and I think here defining the goals is really important. So nutrition, what I, what I will tell my patients is that nutrition is indeed a powerful tool, but how we use it depends on what the goals are and also what the current status is. So nutrition can be very helpful or dietary interventions can be very helpful uh, for dealing, for example, with side effects of cancer treatments. And this is not necessarily an anti-cancer efficacy endpoint, but ultimately, if an individual is able to better tolerate their cancer therapy, you, th you can then potentially achieve a higher, what we call relative dose intensity, which is essentially delivery of the cancer treatment. Uh, and, and there, I would say we've used a powerful tool such as nutrition to get that treatment into the system and treat that cancer. On the other hand, um, a, a purist might say, I'm interested in what is the anti-cancer effect of that dietary intervention that you're talking about. And that's where, of course, we have a lot of ambiguity, a lot of claims that have yet to be substantiated. And this gets to the concept that Irvi was just talking about, whereby we have a lot of observational data and we have a lot of strong molecular observational data, which is essentially taking the observations and validating them against biological processes in, in, in the laboratory, as Irvi was discussing. Uh, but that is not the gold standard prospective randomized control trial, which is required to introduce a new cancer therapy uh, into the clinic. And so when somebody asks me that question, what I will say is, well, first of all, the type of dietary intervention that we recommend for you is going to, we'll, we have to use the same process that we use for selecting a drug for an individual. We have to look at their genetics, we have to look at their genomics, we have to look at the type of cancer, and then we have to look at what biological processes is that type of dietary intervention targeting and could that be useful for that individual's cancer. This is why we and others are starting to now do this kind of work where we're running randomized control trials, testing different types of dietary interventions with, uh, with clean cancer related endpoints so that ultimately we can have a more robust answer to that question. But for now, a lot of our advice is indeed based on molecular epidemiology uh, and advising patients more so on methods to increase treatment delivery. Okay. This patient now says, thank you 
for explaining that to me. Um, I've I've heard from various people about the benefits of a whole food plant based diet. I've heard from other people about a ketogenic diet, and I believe this is the rationale for that really wonderful paper that the two of you put together um, that kind of walked through how to different diets uh, potentially address different biological processes happening in cancer. Um, so perhaps we can, let's start this exploration of this paper with, if a patient says to you, should I be going down the, the sort of high carb uh, plant-based direction or is a ketogenic diet going to be better for me in treating my cancer? So just if we think about it from, again, like we talked about the prevention, treatment and survivorship settings, I think what we allude to in the paper or talk about is in the prevention setting, um, a lot of the large population studies from the USA, UK and France uh, show that Plant forward diets or plant based diets are associated with reduced risk of developing cancer overall and also specific cancers. So that's in the epidemiologic setting. But when we think about it in terms of mechanisms, um, you know, it, with a plant based diet, we're thinking about the increased fiber, which could reduce intestinal transit time or uh, increase butyrate levels in the stool, which have anti cancer, anti inflammatory properties. And then also we do know, and um, you know, you've had this in, in your previous episodes as well, like how a plant-based diet can affect diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease and how Neil alluded to that it's not just the direct effect, but the indirect effect of being able to tolerate treatments well. So I think that the strongest data in terms of just directly and indirectly affecting tumor is through plant-based diets. Um, and through multiple mechanisms, even insulin, insulin-like growth factor. Um, and when we think about ketogenic diets, they too have uh, specific ways that they could be through the ketone bodies and weight loss. Um, but those are things that need to be looked at in very specific treatment settings because ketogenic diets can sometimes be hard to sustain long-term. So we should think about it as a therapeutic synergistic intervention, maybe with treatment for specific cancers once a trial shows a positive result and then think about it for the patient. So as of now, if I am telling patients, I would say that, you know, do whatever diet you might want to, but if you can get 80 or 90% of your calories from unprocessed plant foods, then that would be important. So if you do like a ketogenic diet, try to have the ketogenic diet be more plant-based because we know that there is some anti-cancer benefits to the plant-forward foods. Yeah, you know, I, I, I completely agree. And, and, and I, I, I think of it, you know, the, my, my perspective on this is you know, when we are looking at the risk reduction setting, right, what, what is the path that has the least propensity for going astray? And we know from a large body of work that, as, as Orvi alluded to, that the effects of a plant forward, a majority plant based diet, uh, has many, many effects that all work in concert together uh, to probably have the greatest anti-cancer or risk reduction um, effect. And in addition to that, uh, I would argue, um, has less of a chance of, of, of going astray. So for example, if somebody's following a ketogenic diet, uh, an individual may feel inclined uh, or, or even be misinstructed uh, to consume more processed meats. Uh, for example, because yes, you can generate ketones by eating processed meats, but we also know that that processed meat uh, can has has a direct and dangerous impact on cancer development. Uh, for example, colon cancer. Whereas in a in a plant whole food plant based diet, yes, of course you can eat. Doritos and Twinkies all day and say that you're eating a plant forward or plant based diet. Uh, but I think that it's, 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 it's a little more clear that you really need to be consuming fruits and vegetables and, th and, and things that are not as processed. Um, and in addition to that, I would also argue that most of our data, uh, when we talk about cancer as a diverse disease state, most of our data indicates that whole food plant based diets impact many of the processes that are common amongst a lot of these cancers, 
Whereas, as, as Urvi said, the, the ketogenic approach or some of these subspecialized diet approaches, they may be successful biologically for s certain pathways, but those certain pathways may not be as common across all cancers and may be more effective in very specific si scenarios or situations. In my book, I wrote, food is not medicine per se. And <laughs> I, I don't think that's hugely controversial, but it does run a little bit counter, I guess, to a lot of the messaging in the, in the wellness um, world. And it wasn't, it wasn't a flippant statement that I was making. It was something that I'd spent a lot of time thinking about. What's your take on this idea of, of food as medicine or food is medicine? I seem to have the same philosophy as you that food is a very powerful tool, but health is so much more complex than just nutrition. Right? And it's giving too much power to food. Like, yes, food is a very powerful tool and being adequately nourished um, and having a healthful diet can have many health benefits. But saying that food is medicine often gets translated into people thinking that food is an alternative to medicine. And it is not working in the same way. It's not working through uh, those same mechanisms. So it's powerful, but we have to, I did a post about this too before, it's like to really truly respect the power of nutrition. You respect what it can and cannot do. And also, I don't say that with a flippant regard either in studying nutrition. I know the power of it, but also know really big limitations. What would it take, I guess, for you, and, and I guess I'm asking myself this question, to kind of actually see food as medicine, would it be a clinical trial that put some sort of dietary intervention, specific dietary intervention up against a something like chemotherapy or, or whatever that was proven and led to better survival rates? Do you think in that instance, then all of a sudden that dietary intervention could be considered a form of medicine or would you still see it as, as distinct? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't think we'll ever have a trial like that. Um, there is an example of a trial like that that did diet versus uh, conventional chemotherapy, and it did not work out well. Uh, but for example, like the DASH diet, right, the dietary approach to stop hypertension, that was uh, testing a diet alone and seeing how it could impact uh, blood pressure. And it was very powerful, uh, the impact of diet. But I think maybe what I would like to see is that we see diet and treatment compared to treatment alone and seeing more significant benefits. And then uh, it's like, well, I wouldn't say it's medicine. It is an adjunct to medicine. So in terms of us kind of um, creating a, a scaffold for this conversation, so your position is that nutrition is powerful. It's really important. And when you have cancer, there are certain aspects of your nutrition that you want to focus on based on changing of, of uh, nutrient requirements and potential nutrient status during that period. Yes, absolutely. We do know that uh, diet recommendations do change during cancer treatment. The body has different needs as it's going through cancer treatment. And so we can utilize manipulation of the diet to help optimize the health of the individual, help optimize healing and recovery, improve quality of life. So nutrition yeah, can definitely be used as a tool to help support an individual during treatment. Why do you think that a lot of this misinformation and fear mongering exists? Is it, is it simply a playbook to, to kind of sell things? Is, it, is that really what it all boils down to? Now, as you had mentioned earlier, this is a very vulnerable population. Uh, cancer treatment is scary. Having I mean, cancer is scary. Cancer treatments are scary and a lot of their side effects. So people are absolutely vulnerable to trying to find something that feels safer and not as scary. I think that is an opportunity for people to make money. If they're like, well, we can offer an alternative that sounds less scary. We can offer more support. We can explain it in a way that makes more sense to them than maybe what they're hearing from their oncologist or in their um, healthcare team. So I think that there are people, I, th I think there is some harm <laughs> that they're, they don't maybe understand how much harm they are doing. 
but I do believe it is for financial gain. But also to try and error, like maybe there are people who truly do believe this and truly believe that diet alone can cure cancer and they want people to jump on that train. But I kind of lean on the side of this is a very vulnerable population who is looking for help. And these people are offering that help. Right. Yeah, they might they might be convinced, but they they may just not be aware of, I guess, some of the biases that that could be at play there that could be skewing their view of a particular intervention, say some sort of juice detox or a particular diet. I always think about if you jump on to um, some sort of social media page that's touting the specific benefits of, of some sort of um, natural alternative therapy that hasn't been tested in a, in a clinical setting, I always think about the fact that, you know, firstly, while some of this can be interesting and, and sort of hypothesis generating, it's not validated. So if Simon jumps on and sort of shares his story about, you know, I had prostate cancer or something and I did a particular juice cleanse and I became prostate cancer free. Well, the first thing is, uh, and I don't want to sort of invalidate anyone's experience, but we have no way of validating, did Simon actually have prostate cancer at the start? Was the diagnosis accurate? Um, we have no idea as to all of the other things that he was potentially doing in his life. And we have no idea of knowing for every Simon that exists how many Stevens and Marks and Michaels did the same thing and had a really bad outcome who could have gone down another path with a proven therapy and had a much better outcome. So we can sometimes, I think, get caught up in the anecdote and and sort of lose sight of the real reason for the scientific method and the importance of having clinical trials, whether you're looking at a drug or you're looking at a natural therapy. Absolutely. I think you summed that up very well, that these anecdotes can be really powerful and sound promising. And maybe when they're talking to their healthcare provider or looking up things online, it's numbers, it's statistics. Right? And that's not as powerful maybe as hearing a story about someone who had this cancer and it was cured, but when there's really no way of validating that that happened. Um, and I know that there are, um, it's actually, I forget her name, but she was someone based in Australia who was touting uh, her diet as a cure to her cancer, and she never had cancer. Yeah, I remember that. There was a, I think that might have been a, a young influencer from memory. It ended up in the the media. It was quite quite the story at the time. Um, it actually makes me think that potentially uh, it could be quite powerful to, to get some qualitative information from clinical trials and stories from within clinical trials um, to, and, and use those as a way of um, giving people a bit more of a, a feel or connection to the person. Um, because you're right, that's where the anecdote online does sort of you know draw people in. They, they can relate to that. It's, it can be difficult to relate to you know, just the outcomes of a study, the the numbers that we see. And I've heard from, you know, patients who go on, they're looking for support and they go into these support groups and they're hearing a lot of anecdotes of supplements to take, diets to try. And sometimes a lot of that information is coming from, this information is coming from their own community um, and right, not maybe discussing about, well, I was also on this therapy or I didn't have the same dose as you did. So, you know, they're attributing, maybe not having side effects, to a supplement, but they might have been on a different dose and regimen of that therapy. What are we seeing, I guess, um, in developed countries you know, ar around the world in terms of cancer incidents and the types of cancers that people are getting? Is this something that's that's been changing a lot? Have we have we seen the survival rates improving? Are we seeing more people get cancer, less people get cancer? Uh, survival here in the U.S. is improving. Um, and a lot of that is related to there's less lung cancer, uh, less uh, lung cancer um, incidence has been on the decline, but we are seeing an increase in more cancers that are related to obesity, like pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, a colorectal cancer. Uh, so there is changes going on in the types of cancer that are becoming more prevalent. Um, one thing of concern is the increasing rate of colorectal cancer in young adults. 
to. We're seeing a decline in older adults, but an increase in the younger adult uh, population. Not quite sure what's going on there. There's definitely a lot of active investigation into why, but it's shifting. So today we're we're going to zoom in on uh, nutrition to support cancer treatment. Um, But before we get there, I guess, broadly speaking, is the nutrition advice that you would typically give for a cancer patient similar to what you would give to someone who didn't have cancer that wanted to eat in a way that lowered their risk of cancer? Oh, that's a good question. It, it kind of depends on the cancer type. There are some cancer types where we need to be much more focused on higher calorie, high protein. Um, that's a general recommendation. Like, let's talk about the impact of cancer treatments. Uh, most common therapy that people receive is chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is a systemic treatment. It is not just damaging cancer cells. We also see healthy cells uh, being damaged. So the individual is going to need more protein, more calories to help those healthy cells recover so that that individual is ready for the next round of treatment. Um, And I'd say during treatment, I'm much less concerned about, did you get all five servings of fruits and vegetables that day? It's did you get adequate calories and protein in that day? Because if you did not, what's going to happen? We're going to see muscle loss. And this is particularly concerning in the cancer population. There is strong body of evidence that shows that muscle loss during treatment is associated with poor survival, poor outcomes, more treatment toxicities. So a priority during treatment is to try to maintain weight, maintain muscle. Um, so kind of broad stroke there, but that is what's most important during treatment. Now, absolutely, if they can meet their calorie and protein needs with a variety of plant-based foods, that's great. But that priority really needs to be getting adequate nutrition to support the body going through these really challenging treatments. Okay. So there's an increased um, energy requirement during cancer treatment. Would that be fair to to say? Um, an increased importance of protein for a variety of reasons, I I presume, for the immune system, but specifically as well for preserving muscle. Um, There is an increased need or requirement for certain micronutrients. Would that also be fair to say? So we don't have as much research about what particular micronutrients might be uh, needed in higher amounts. Um, that's a challenge there about the micronutrients needs, but there is going to be a little more you know, cell turnover. So it might need more B12, right? Or iron as we're getting more red blood cells that need to be made because they got suppressed by the chemotherapy. So what's happening within the microbiome with someone is experiencing FODMAP sensitivity intolerance. So they're they're getting, you know, bloating and, and gas from these certain types of sugars that are making their way down into the, the large intestine and, and kind of fermenting. Why what would someone's microbiome perhaps look like that's experiencing that versus someone who doesn't? Yeah. It's a bit tricky. I so it Those who are in the IBS, the irritable bowel syndrome space, really study this deeply. I'm not in that particular space. I study more the inflammatory conditions. Um, But it can be a combination of small bowel overgrowth. So you're actually getting bacteria, like I mentioned earlier, fermenting in the small bowel when they shouldn't be, you know, they should be fermenting in the gut. Um, But even if you ferment in the gut, that can cause discomfort as well and a lot of other problems. Um, And so what is likely happening is you, your composition of microbes is has a, a higher proportion of these bacteria that really love these FODMAP, these oligosaccharides in the diet. And you might have more of them than the next person. So it's probably a compositional change there. So it's it's like over-fermentation? Because some fermentation would, would occur normally, right, yeah. to produce short-chain fatty acids. Sure, yeah. Okay. But it's these, there's, there's certain food types that are – that microbes really like to sort of break down. Um, and people who consume like a lot of sugar alcohols often, it's kind of those types of, it's these 
kind of polyols that you, you see, and microbes really like them. Um, and so the idea is if you stop eating them, and this is true for any dietary component, if you stop eating that component of the diet, you almost can kill off those starve bugs. Them. You starve them, yeah. Right. And you reduce their numbers. You may not get rid of them totally, but you can reduce their numbers. And then that's why I say slowly titrate back. Because FODMAP is not a long-term diet. You can't, you can't stay on that forever. It's really restrictive. And it's kind of odd, like the things... You know, it's like, why this and not that? It'd be hard to adhere to long-term. Long-term, yeah. So you slowly start to titrate those foods back, and then you can kind of reshift. You can kind of alter your population a little bit. Um, That's sort of the thinking behind it. Do you think that's why, I mean, anecdotally online, there's certainly a number of people that have reported improvement in some type of either local gastrointestinal symptom like bloating or gas or some sort of inflammatory symptom by removing all plant foods oh, and they're just yeah, eating yeah. Um, a- animal foods yeah. is do you think this sort of FODMAP sensitivity would be playing a part mm. in that yeah I mean a lot of time for individuals who are experiencing a lot of the bloating and I've, I've witnessed this firsthand when you remove these highly fermentable foods from the diet you can almost eliminate many of the bloating symptoms. And so plant-based foods, but it's, again, it's very personal. It's very individual. Not If you did that, if someone else eliminated all their plant-based foods, it might cause other problems right. in their body. Yeah, I mean, you do hear also the case studies of crazy diarrhea and all yeah. sorts of things happening. So yeah. it can go exactly. both ways. No, everything <laughs> is at the extremes, it never works in the extremes. Yeah. You know, it's really, again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, it's really about balance in the body. But it is true. I mean, microbes they love fiber and fiber is a good thing to eat in terms of creating diversity of your microbiome and in short chain fatty acid production, but it causes problems in other people. And so when the people who have come to me with that problem, when I tell them, okay, shift to a more, you know, protein based diet, protein and fat based diet, often the symptoms go away, but it worked for that person. It may not work for the next person. Right. And long term. So is it, a, is it a problem, you kind of alluded to it before, but a problem to restrict fiber consumption long-term or will the microbiome adapt in a way where it will take those other foods, whatever foods probably, if they're high protein, high fat, they're animal foods, and will be able to use those as substrates to produce the compounds that that person needs? Like how, how much adaptability is there? So there's definitely adaptability in that, If you stop eating, if you switch to the carnivore diet and you stop eating plant foods, you will lose all of those fermenty type bugs that that are adapted to plant material um, or grains or things like that. And you will promote the bacteria that love to consume meat-based products. And it's not necessarily that you're evolving to support microbes that are beneficial to you it's more that you're promoting the bugs that just love that food that you're eating it may not always be a good thing and so fermentation of protein um has been studied quite a bit and that occurs in the colon and the byproducts of, of fermentation of of animal protein specifically um tend to be not very good for you um and I think th- that could be a concern. There's a lot of sulfur components that come off of that fermentation process. It's very, they're not short chain fatty acids. Your bugs are not gonna start making short chain fatty acids from, from protein. Um, Those they, metabolites, are they, they're associated with certain disease states? Yeah, people have studied them in the context of colon cancer um, and intestinal inflammation primarily. Um, and there's literature on this. There isn't enough research in that space because they're, haven't been enough people to go on those diets yeah i saw one study and it was i think it was published in nature i think it's about 2014 or 15 um is it david lawrence yeah 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 I, you know, that's sort of I'm a seminal about. it's like an yeah. animal based versus a plant-based yeah and and i actually saw another a study of yours mm-hmm. i think it was in mice we yeah. it was like a a saturated fat yeah. versus an unsaturated fat right, i'll let yeah. you explain it but in yeah. both of those i found it interesting that well in yours i believe the saturated fat group and in david's paper the animal based group led to an increase in uh, biophilia wadsworthia yeah yeah correct it, it it changes the bile acid composition when you shift 
to a more fat and, and mainly fat based diet and, and protein as a part of that. But um, both of our studies found this bile acid signature and the, bi the bile acids are important in the body. We need them. They help us break down and emulsify fats so that we can take them up and distribute them throughout the body. There's been a lot of research on the interaction between primary and secondary bile acids in the microbiome and research showing that conversion um, of micro by microbes of secondary bile acids creates kind of carcinogenic compounds. So you always have bile, you can change the composition of it by what you eat dramatically. So if you shift to a more fat and protein based diet, you fundamentally shift the profile to one that provides a substrate for this Bilophila wadsworthia to grow. And it produces hydrogen sulfide as a major byproduct, which is genotoxic, it, it causes damage to your intestines. So these and that's just one example of a stepwise process that where diet can shift the microbiome indirectly through changing the host chemistry. Um, and that likely happens in multiple different processes. And so any extreme will do that, but your body works fine in, in down the middle. But if you go to the edges, it will usually like push, you know, push the system in such a way that you'll get like a real skewing of your microbiome. Right. So maybe take us inside the gut. Let's create a scenario here where we're, we're talking about a health, a person with a healthy microbiome, right? And they have great diversity, but they develop an infection. And I think before you said that when you develop the infection, you'll be in a state of dysbiosis. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. They take their course of antibiotics. What's happening to that person's microbiome during that, that phase? Well, there are... Uh three main things that happen within the microbiome when you take antibiotics. One, a loss of diversity. Two, um, you are causing widespread damage to the species. And three, you are choosing or selecting the uh, resistant microbes. And so effectively, if you think about, we were just talking about dysbiosis a moment ago, and then you, the next question was, what happens when you take antibiotics? And after describing them, basically what I've just described is you are medically inducing dysbiosis. And um, with the exception of adding the antibiotic resistance element. Are the antibiotics, are they eradicating species? Like are, are we actually losing, I think you said, so some studies show you may only have 50 species, but then there's you know other uh, reviews and whatnot that'll say 300 to 1,000. So the jury's a little bit out there. But when we take whatever the number is that we have, we take antibiotics, are we losing species or are we kind of just like dimming the light and losing the total number of the good guys that exist in the gut, but we still have the species that we had before we were taking the antibiotics well, the the, the, um, the term that we use for species when we're looking at these things is is richness richness is the term for a number of different species which is a little bit different than diversity by the way diversity also takes into account the presence of different species so like for example you know um, we wouldn't call it um, diverse if we had 300 of one species and you know one of like five other species right like that's just but uh, anyway, so with, with this, when we look at richness, which is the number of different species, we see that when you take antibiotics, you are re definitely reducing the richness. Now, the question is, will they come back? Because I do, because if they do come back, then it's more akin to what you're describing of dimming the lights. Um, and if you look at the research, it is clear the gut does eventually recover we do get the species back. How long does that take usually? This is the million dollar question. And that brings me to, it feels like this is a good time for us to talk about a new study that came out uh, about a year ago in the journal Cell, which um, we've talked about on this show before. Cell is one of the most prestigious medical journals out there. And in this study, Simon, they took a group of 20 people. Now, let me say these people did not have infections. And the reason why they chose to study healthy people 
is because if you, as we were discussing a moment ago, if a person has an infection, like their microbiome is already disrupted. So let's start with a healthy microbiome that has not been disrupted and see what the effect of these antibiotics are. And so they gave four different types of antibiotics to these people and they watched to see what happens. Now, our response to these antibiotics is very individualized. So you can't say that because you took this antibiotic, this is exactly how long your microbiome is going to be knocked down and this is when you will recover. For the majority of the people in this study, and by the way, it was only five days of antibiotics, only five days, whereas like many antibiotics people take for 10 or 14 days. And in some cases, people are taken for even more than 14 days. In this study, the vast majority of people recovered their microbiome by two months. Okay. And were they, were they adopting any specific protocols? I know we're going to talk for about recovery. That. No, they did not. But right. there were people that were in this study that wished that they had specific protocols because there were some bad things that took place. So there was, a, again, these are healthy people. They showed up and they were, and participated in a study and were grateful that they did this. Do you know what kind of antibiotics they were taking? Yeah, the, these were mostly antibiotics that were given for pneumonia. So it was basically like a series of four different antibiotics that were like typical sort of pneumonia style uh, antibiotics. So like an example would be levofloxacin. Levofloxacin is one of the examples. So we call that levoquin in the United States. So um, anyway, there were three people that had a completely different response to the antibiotics. And it's actually quite disturbing what happened to these three people. They lost diversity, they continued to lose diversity, and they did not recover their microbiome for six months. And in that process, um, their microbiome, and the authors, by the way, literally say what I'm about to say. This is not me just being hyperbolic. This is like the exact language they used in the paper. Their microbiome resembled what you would find in a person who is sick, like extremely sick, critically ill in the intensive care unit. So um, we don't know exactly why that happened to those particular people. Did they look at, at what these people were eating? Uh, they did not look at what these people were eating but they did look at their diversity. And again, this is a very small study. Um, one of the uh, challenges that we have when we get into this space of discussing antibiotics and what happens after antibiotics is that we need more data. Yeah, I was just thinking then, like, are we, are we assuming that antibiotics across the board all have the same effect? Because no, they there don't. are so many, right? No, they don't. They have different effects. Well, but I think what they're showing in this study though, is that like here are these different antibiotics that you could use to treat pneumonia. Again, pneumonia, if you don't take an antibiotic, can be a life-threatening condition. So we, you need the antibiotics. And with these, uh, with these, in this case, here are these three people who have a very, very different response that appears to be like kind of disturbing in terms of how this all played out. And what they found for these three people is if you look at the starting diversity within their microbiome, again, this is a small number. Um, we need more data. But if you look at their starting diversity, their starting diversity was significantly less than the other people. That's interesting. That reminds me of the people in the Sonnenberg's fiber fermented food study with the, the folks who didn't do so well on the fiber diet. Yeah, they had low diversity because, they, because with the low diversity, they were struggling to ramp up their fiber. Okay, so this so far is mechanisms related to fiber microbiome, short chain fatty acids, and how they can affect metabolism, energy balance. Yep. But mechanisms are one thing. What evidence do we have that all of this plays out in, in humans? Yeah, let's put it to the test. We, we don't wanna just take mechanisms. That not, that's not the way we roll. We wanna take real human research. And we're gonna to turn to uh, a famous NIH researcher named Kevin Hall. He does uh, met metabolism research and he's um, very well known for these studies where he'll take a group of people and they, I'm not sure how much they're paid to do this, but they will get locked up in a essentially like a dormitory and they will just eat the food that he's providing to them. Okay, so we call this a metabolic ward. And essentially they're enrolling in a clinical study for more than a month and they are served trays of food and they are not allowed to bring in any outside snacks or anything like this, okay? So in this metabolic ward study that we're about to talk about that was published in Nature Medicine in February of 2021, um, they, uh, they did two weeks on a completely plant-based diet. 
and they did two weeks on a ketogenic diet, an animal-based ketogenic diet. Now, both of these diets were matched for protein intake. So protein was the same. Uh, it was the carbs and the fat that were different. So of course, the keto diet was high fat, low carb, and the plant-based diet was high carb, low fat. And there were other, there were two other major differences between the groups. The, the plant-based diet was high in fiber. The keto diet was high in saturated fat. Now with both of these, they were served food and then they were told, eat until you're full. Just keep eating until you're full. Okay, so they were not cut off. Right, ad lib. Ad lib. And, um, and everyone crossed over, so they were controlling for themselves. So each person got to do two weeks on each of these diets. And basically what we see is that, um, so I want to pull up a, a, a figure here for everyone to take a look at. What we're looking at here is the body weight change that's taking place, being measured in kilograms, by the way. So each, bear in mind, each kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Just to be clear as well, you're talking about the folks that are tuning in on YouTube. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, you might need to flick over. Okay, and I'm gonna describe it so people can uh, also hear it through my voice. But if you're on YouTube, you can take a look and you might wanna pull up YouTube if you're just listening on the audio. Um, but basically what you see here on this first graph is that the red line is going to be the, the animal-based keto diet. And people are clearly losing more weight on the animal-based keto diet. Are you disappointed, Simon? No, because I know the results. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so people did lose more weight on the ketogenic diet, but the question is what kind of weight were they losing? Because there's this assumption that many times we jump to of, oh, I lost weight, that must be good. But what if, it's, what if you're losing the part that you don't wanna lose? And so the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is the fat-free mass and how much this was changing. Now, fat-free mass, fat-free mass, what is this? Muscle, Simon. water, bones. Exactly. Now, hopefully they're not losing bones. So basically <laughs> what they're losing here with this is muscle and water. And what you can see uh, is that with the red line that on the animal-based ketogenic diet, there is a significant decline in fat-free mass that takes place during the first week. So, you know, once again, like when you cut your carbs, um, you pee out and you look great in the mirror, but what you've lost is not fat, you've mm. lost water weight. Right, you've depleted glycogen, and with that yeah. comes a lot of water that's lost. Yeah, and and like, look, I mean, if I were uh, competing in a bodybuilding competition, that that's what I would do in the last you know couple of days before the event. But nonetheless, so the plant based diet, though, like you don't want to lose fat free mass, and the plant based diet was maintaining its fat free mass throughout the study, so that's a beautiful thing. What you did want to lose was fat. You want to lose fat mass, right? We want to burn fat. So we've been talking about this, you know, the second sort of thing that short chain fatty acids do is they help us to consume the fat, metabolize it, get rid of it, get it out of our body. And guess what? That is exactly what we see on the high fiber plant-based diet. Over the course of two weeks, they lost uh, significantly more. You can see a separation between the lines. There's a significant decrease on the plant-based low fat diet in terms of their fat loss, um, as opposed to the keto diet which did lose some fat, but not nearly as much as you did with the plant-based diet. So they're, they're metabolizing their fat. Now, uh, this is really cool because it brings us back to the very first point about fiber and microbes, which is that they make us feel full. We achieve satiety. Right, so they measured how satisfied people were. They, they measured hunger, satisfaction, and fullness, and the two diets were exactly the same. Despite eating almost 700 calories less. This is the key. This is the key is in this last graph for those on YouTube, what you see here, the red line is the keto diet, the green line is the plant-based diet and on the plant-based diet, every single day that they were on the plant-based diet, they consumed less calories on average, even though they achieved the exact same levels of hunger, satisfaction and fullness. And when you average it out, it was about 700 calories less per day on the plant-based diet compared to the keto diet. And if you want to put that in the framework of like losing weight, 700 calories, that means in about five days, you're going to lose a pound. Wow. And just to be clear on the on the bodybuilding strategy for, for getting ready for a stage, I think that the protocol tends to be some calorie restriction, carb restriction going in, but then on the day, they often carbohydrate up to get that glucose to kind of flood back into the muscles and, and puff up. So 
Just want to make that clear for your next bodybuilding comp. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have yet to enter a bodybuilding competition, but uh, I will you're, you're consult you way. next time. Right. Thank you. Uh, so let me play devil's advocate. That's that's a two week study, right? Yeah. Um, how do we know if that continues to kind of play out over the long term, or if there's some type of adaptation process, and then you know the the difference in calorie consumption starts to even out? Sure. We can we can take a look at. Um, randomized control trials, randomized control trials where people increase their fiber intake have clearly demonstrated, uh, this is by the way from Andrew Reynolds in the Lancet 2019, have clearly demonstrated that people lose weight when they increase their fiber consumption. Um, there's also uh, um, uh, waist circumference data that shows that fiber consumption achieves a, a, a lower waist circumference. Um, and there's also fat, uh, fat um, uh, lost data that have uh, been shown as well. So, but, and those are the randomized control trials. The other thing that we could look at is um, long-term population-based data. So one of the areas where we often will take a look are the Adventist two studies. So in, in the Adventist two studies, they were studying the Seventh-day Adventists. And this is a unique population because um, due to their sort of community and religious practices, they uh, are far more likely to be vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian than you'll find in traditional American society. So you actually get an opportunity to take a look and see what these kind of unique groups are doing. And what you find in, within these, this population is that there's only one group, Simon, that has an average body mass index that is less than 25. Those are the vegans. And the other groups, if you were to order them from lowest body mass index up to highest, it would start with vegan and then vegetarian and then pescatarian and then omnivore. Right. And so that would be an inverse relationship with fiber intake. So the body mass index was inversely correlated with fiber intake, meaning that the highest fiber intake was in the vegans, second highest fiber intake was vegetarians, third highest was the pescatarians. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.